has to be his. And <laughs> pushing it all around. pushing it out. <laughs> I said, well, don't spend money and take credit. Good morning. I'd like to uh, call this meeting to order, the Thursday, December 18th Delta Stewardship Council meeting. Welcome all of those of you who are here in attendance, those of you who are following on the webcast, and to my colleagues at the, uh, the front table, all welcome. Uh, we'll begin with uh, roll call, beginning on my far right. Fiorini here. We have a quorum. And the mayor's outside somewhere. She kept popped in and I saw her. She's here. She's here. Mayor Brown uh, will be arriving very shortly. All right, that concludes uh, file items one and two. File item number three adoption of the November 20th, 2014 meeting summary. Somebody care to offer? Johnson moves to tie in second. Any discussion? Then beginning on my far right, the vote. Aye. Fear any aye? Eisenberg aye. aye. Motion passes unanimously. Aye. On to file item number four. Um, we have uh, somewhat of an abbreviated agenda today. It is my goal to uh, work through uh, the noon hour and hopefully uh, wrap things up by one or two o'clock. Although it's an abbreviated agenda, it is very, uh, we've got some very important items to discuss. So we will devote the appropriate amount of time necessary to, um, to adequately treat those issues. But our goal is, for those of you that are following, to be wrapped up by one or two today. <laughs> uh, I'll take that, uh, that recommendation under consideration. Um, to, to begin my report, um, is in uh, any, uh, we, we have gains and, and losses, and I, I want to first acknowledge a gain, and that is uh, a month ago I mentioned that we were in the running to receive an executive fellow. I'm pleased to announce today that uh, uh, we were awarded an executive fellow. We're thrilled to have uh, Gavin Landgraf uh, on staff, and um, he has been uh, working diligently for about three weeks. Just a, uh, a treat to have the youthful enthusiasm and the skill set that he brings to the Delta Stewardship Council. You'll be hearing from him soon, but a delightful young man, very talented and a, a great asset uh, that uh, has been added to the Delta Stewardship Council staff. Um, that's the gain. Um, a couple of losses. One, um, we have, well, lo retirements. We, we haven't lost anybody. But, um, Dan Siegel, who uh, you have heard from, those of you that follow us regularly, uh, is uh, a representative from the Attorney General's office that has helped us uh, through the Delta plan development stages and has been a very uh, integral part of the defense and um, the responding to the multiple lawsuits that resulted as, uh, from the Delta plan approval. Uh, Dan uh, will be stepping down, uh, but uh, the good news is it's not a complete loss because he will continue to serve as an, uh, what do we call this, Chris? An, an retired annuitant to continue to help us uh, with the uh, legal defense. So uh, I, with, um, without objection, we intend to honor Dan with a certificate of appreciation signed by the council board at the appropriate time. I think that uh, looks like a nod of an, aff an affirmation. So thank you for that. Patrick? Uh, on that point, um, Dan's service goes back to the establishment of the 
uh, Adult Protection Commission, and my guess is, Larry, that you'll be acknowledge you'll be acknowledging them too as the Adult Protection Commission. But well, yeah, no, I. I <laughs> All right, well, that's a very good segue because um, <clears throat> today marks Larry Ruthstaller's final uh, meeting as a council member of the Delta Stewardship Council. Larry, as you know, is seated on the council by virtue of the fact that he has been the chair of the Delta Protection Commission. And we've been privileged to have Larry as a part of the team for almost two years. Yeah. And um, Larry, it's been entertaining. Uh, we appreciate the, the, the contributions that you have made uh, in, the, in the period of time that you've been here. We hope that you uh, stay in touch. Uh, I know you're not only retiring from our board, from the Delta Protection Commission, but also from the San Joaquin County Board of Supervisors. Forced, Forced retirement. But I'm sure you have future plans. So uh, in recognition of your years of service here, we've uh, prepared a gift for you. Six bottles of beer, not your own. <laughs> so on behalf of the council, I would like to uh, present to you the Certificate of Appreciation. Uh, Delta Stewardship Council honors Frank Larry Ruthstaller is a member of the Council and Chair of the Delta Protection Commission for his dedicated service, wise leadership, and stewardship of the Delta. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Appreciate it. That's not hyacinth in the foreground, is it? Uh, no, we don't see any weeds here, but oh, yeah, oh, yeah, there's something there. <laughs> Larry, thank you. That uh, completes file item number four. On to file item number five, executive officer's report, Dan Ray. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yeah, it, it's uh, nice to gather here on a sunny morning, at least between the rainstorms, you know, while we're recovering from flooding both north and south, and yet always reminded we're in the middle of a drought. I got a Facebook post from the National Weather Service last night that said three of the four floodways in the Sacramento Valley had spilled and were inundated. Um, and... Uh, what happened spilled? Uh, YOLO, which is flooding from the coastal streams, but I don't think the Fremont Weir, at least in the thing I got last night, it hadn't spilled. But it is enough, you know, to make you, ducks, even the most, the like it. you know, veteran uh, water people skeptical and probably the general public a little confused how we can have flooding and drought. At the same time, I had to agree with uh, the column at uh, Skelton? George Skelton did that said, well, we just ought to be, uh, take a little time to be grateful for the precipitation, even if it's only a, a respite, because there's really no way to know whether it's a wet month or a wet year in the midst of an ongoing uh, period of uh, drought, or whether it's really the beginning of a significant period of precipitation that'll end the drought. The, our partners at the um, geological survey pointed out Thursday that it'll take if I did the math right, 33 and a half million acre feet of water to recover the supplies that have been used up since the drought began. They had a, trillion well, they reported gallons, and uh, you know, it's sad to say I had to convert it to acre feet to understand how much water that was. Um, they're using satellites now to generate the first ever estimates of how much water the state needs to recover from the drought by measuring the amount of water that's been lost in the Sacramento and San Joaquin basins. That, the amount that's gone is nearly seven times the capacity of Lake Shasta. And it's a combination of the amount of water that's been used up from the aquifers in the Sacramento and San Joaquin Valley as well as reflects the loss the snowpack, which was the third lowest in history this year. So while I got to concede at home, I've stopped dumping my dishwater on our sopping winter garden it's still important we all use water efficiently and keep uh, diversifying local supplies, get on with uh, improving storage. Uh, all key points of the Delta plan, and uh, we can talk about this as we get into the discussion of the California water plan uh, with the folks from DWR. Also this week, and to prepare for the prospect that the winter may not relieve the shortage of water, last Friday, the five federal and state agencies that are primarily involved in the operation and regulation 
of the state and federal water projects jointly released the draft interagency drought um, strategy. You remember that Carla Nemeth um, from the Sec Under Secretary, Deputy Secretary of Natural Resources talked about this with you at, at our November meeting and the draft outlines the anticipated uh, drought response actions that have been planned by the Bureau of Reclamation and DWR and the state and federal fish agencies uh, should the drought stretch into another year. Um, the draft's available for comment before it's finalized. And as Carlos said, it, uh, it reflects two lessons they learned so far this in the drought uh, last season. First, the, it's best done if the state and federal agencies are working together in real time with the effective stakeholders. And second, uh, they have to le leave sufficient time for feedback and input from those folks, and many of whom have gotten off a lot of on the ground water management experience. Uh, other things that are going on, uh, the second uh, covered action uh, certification was filed with the council uh, on Monday. I hope you all and the interested public received notice of that. It's for the uh, Dutch Slough Tidal Marsh Restoration Project that we visited back in uh, August. Uh, it's a DWR project. The uh, December 15th filing begins a 30-day public comment period. This is uh, almost a 1,200-acre restoration project in Oakley. Uh, 725 acres of tidal marsh are going to be restored to benefit native fish, or uh, 560, I guess, of tidal marsh, 725 total. You know, that nice recreation area we heard about, recreation trails and shoreline access. You know, this project began back in the Calfit era, and I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, point out that our friends at the Coastal Conservancy San Francisco Bay program also chipped in funds and provided early guidance because uh, they had a lot of experience in tidal marsh restoration. So it's been a great partnership. And, one, maybe we can continue with the new resources provided by the bond. Two other restoration actions are also soon to be undertaken in the Delta by the Department of Fish and Wildlife. Hill Slough in Sassoon Marsh is a three-phase uh, project that will restore um, brackish tidal marsh and associate uplands up in the northern parts of Sassoon, uh, near Sassoon City. And then the Lindsay Slough project, also sometimes called the Calhoun Cut Enhancement Project, is going to reestablish tidal connections in a historic tidal marsh in the Cache Slough complex. Uh, fish and Wildlife has determined that these projects are important to mitigate the drought's effects on fish and wildlife. And so under the governor's drought executive order, they're exempt from CEQA as well as from our covered action process. Uh, but we are working with them through our science program to help them uh, ensure the projects include adequate monitoring and the best science so that they can support the Delta's overall adaptive management efforts and we can learn what they have to teach us. Um, you know, one of the ways we try to implement the Delta plans through commenting on projects that are going to have an impact on the Delta. Uh, two important comment letters on uh, recently released EIRs have went out in the last month. One was on the San Joaquin County's general plan. And there's a lot of great things uh, in the general plan and uh, the water management policies and flood management policies were uh, two really strong areas and it provides protection for a lot of farmlands in the county. Uh, we did um, raise some questions about the policies provision that would prohibit conversion of prime farmlands within the delta for wetlands. It seems like it unnecessarily uh, frustrates uh, a wide variety of restoration actions, including those that are recommended in the delta plan. And um, also, uh, we are concerned about six specific areas that are planned for agriculture and continuing uh, agricultural use in the Delta Plan and that are outside the sphere of influence of the, the, count the cities in the county uh, and distant from their boundaries and that would seem to be uh, maybe perhaps premature conversion to farmlands that would be inconsistent with the Delta Plan's policies. And the other... Dan, Dan was that premature for conversion from farm yeah farm from land? farmlands from yeah. farmland yeah to development yeah, yeah. to development yeah. right okay and the other uh, comment letter was one regarding uh, uh, proposed long-term pr uh, program of water transfers between the CVP and some of their contractors um, we pointed out that the program of transfers uh, would seem to be a covered action and so would fall within the council's jurisdiction we think the EIR and EIS could do a better job of quantifying the needs of water suppliers that are receiving the transfers and that it would be important to make sure we understand how transfers that might take place in a drought period uh, could influence the ability to meet uh, water quality objectives. 
So both of those letters have been filed with those agencies and we'll be working with them. We've had a a good conversations with the county staff and we'll continue to work with them and of course our colleagues at the Bureau as well and the water contractors as they wrap up their uh, proposals. And we have uh, continued to hire staff uh, to carry out the, um, fill the positions that we got in the last budget. Um, uh, in our shop, that includes uh, Kelly Souza, who's joining us this month as a senior environmental scientist in the science division. Uh, she'll work on adaptive management and the peer review program. She currently works as a senior environmental scientist from the Department of Fish and Wildlife down in Stockton, so we're happy to steal her. And then Michael Oakes is joining the planning division as an environmental planner. Uh, he's got a master's degree in conservation biology from the University of Wisconsin and has worked as an environment planner for the Forest Service and others. He's got experience in real estate and environmental interpretation in theater. He's a great communicator, so we're happy to have him on board. At the Water Board, they've also filled in a very important position, hiring Michael George as the new Delta Water Master. You know, that was a position that was created back in 2009 uh, in Form Act's passage, and he'll be responsible for day-to-day -day oversight of water rights and the legal boundaries of the Delta, as well as working the board on um, initiatives that would improve operations of the Delta's water rights system. And then uh, finally, I wanted to, um, since we are acknowledging the retirement of folks, I wanted to acknowledge that uh, Paul Isaacs, one of our own staff, is retiring too. Paul's worked for the council um, in our IT shop. Uh, he began his career uh, as an um, anthropologist and archaeologist working with the Forest Service and other agencies. I've had the pleasure of riding the bus with him back and forth from Davis, so I'll miss those conversations. He, he's a great uh, Davis, uh, example of Davis folks, because his dad uh, was an expert on tomatoes uh, for Campbell's Soup, and he moved here from New Jersey in the 50s when the tomato business was taken off. And so he, he's been able to fill me in a lot on the history of uh, agriculture in Yolo County in the second half of the last century. So I'll miss that partnership with him. So that would complete our my report. But I did want to call up then uh, Gavin Landgraf, uh, who is our new executive fellow. Uh, a lot of folks have been watching perhaps the um, efforts to pass a federal bill that would respond to the drought and while that ultimately uh, didn't occur, uh, we've asked Gavin to look at the um, House Pass bill and give us a little report. It may provide some insights into what we could expect in the coming session. Thank you, Gavin. And Gavin, there's a button to push at the base. There you go. You're Good morning, council members. And uh, it's a privilege to be here presenting before you. And thanks for the introduction earlier, Mr. Chairman. Today I'll be providing a brief update on California drought relief legislation in Congress. Congress has been working on various iterations of a California drought relief bill for the majority of 2014. The latest version is House uh, HR 5781, the California Emergency Drought Relief Act of 2014, which passed the House of Representatives on December 9th. H.R. 5781 authorizes the Secretary of the Interior to maximize water deliveries from the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project through various emergency projects. First, H.R. 5781 authorizes the Secretary of the Interior and Secretary of Commerce to approve projects to provide additional water supplies for the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project unless the proposed project does so in a highly inefficient way. Second, H.R. 5781 authorizes 28 flex days during the water year when South Delta pumping may create excessive reverse flows on the Old and Middle Sacramento rivers. Currently, biological opinions under the Endangered Species Act prohibit reverse flows on the Old and Middle rivers that are greater than 5,000 CFS. These 28 flex days, during which negative flows would be 7,500 CFS, could be used only when, this, when the main Sacramento River is swollen and flowing at 17,000 CFS or higher. Title II of the Act directs the Secretary of the Interior to adhere to California's water rights laws and honor more senior water rights. Now having outlined the bill, I wanted to spend a few moments summarizing its political context. Senator Feinstein was working behind closed doors with the House, of Rep uh, with the House Republicans to develop a drought relief bill that could pass both the House and the Senate. On November 21st, 
Feinstein ended the ne negotiations for this year, expressing her desire to continue the effort in 2015. Lead negotiator for the Republicans, California Congressman Devin Nunez of Tulare, also expressed his desire to continue working with Feinstein in 2015. In the meantime, he and fellow House Republicans pushed ahead with their own bill. H.R. 5781, which just passed the House, was developed without Feinstein. Republicans tried to attach H.R. 5781 to the spending bill last week, but were unsuccessful. The President indicated that he would have vetoed H.R. 781 should it have reached his desk, uh, and the Brown administration has also opposed the bill, implying that it would reignite water wars in California. Thank you. Any questions of Gavin? Good job, Gavin. Thanks. Thank you. Dan? All right. Any questions of Dan regarding any of his report? Then we will move on to um, Chris Stevens. I believe you have uh, no. no report. I'm pleased to report that I don't have a report. All right. <laughs> Very good. Any questions of Chris on that report? Why don't you have a report? <laughs> okay. And uh, let the record show that um, council members Mayor Brown and Judge Damrell uh, um, are here now. Okay, on to file item number six, lead scientist report, Dr. Goodwin. Welcome. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair, and good morning, everyone. There's uh, several things on the uh, um, lead scientist report this month, uh, but I just wanted to start with a, a couple of new developments. The Independent Science Board uh, met last week, and uh, Dr. Judy Meyer, who has served on the Independent Science Board, gosh, way, way before my time, and uh, for those of you who know Dr. Meyer, just a, a world-class uh, ecologist, but also she's very practical with it, and just a uh, one of, the, I think, most of the most influential members of the ISB over the last um, 10 or 15 years. She, she uh, indicated her desire to step down. She had actually hinted at this before, soon after I came on, and we asked her to stay on to see us through the development of the science plan, which she agreed to do. So what she's um, agreed to do is to see through the fish flow and other stresses task that the Independent Science Board is undertaking. And uh, at the conclusion of that, she'll be stepping down. So the Independent Science Board asked uh, the science program to uh, place the announcement for nominations and applications for what will be an open spot uh, so that there isn't going to be a, a big gap. Uh, Dr. Meyer herself, uh, where the fish and flows and other stresses are, originally they had been thinking of uh, wrapping this up at the end of this year, but there's been a lot of uh, independent reviews of fish-related um, activities and they thought in order to make it complete they wanted to ensure that those reviews are included in their in their overview. So in January they will be posting a draft of the fish flows and other stresses for public comment and they're currently planning to you wrap that report up in uh, March next year and so that would be the transition time when Dr. Meyer will step off. But we certainly hope she'll stay engaged. Uh, the ISB is a very big time commitment for folks, but uh, we certainly intend to tap into her on other more focused review panels in the future. So we hope to have that um, announcement for, for nominations uh, you up on the webpage by the end of uh, this month. Uh, also, for those of you who are interested, there was uh, some discussion of the work group that they have on adaptive management, and there was a very interesting discussion about how they could make this um, overview report that they're developing uh, most useful. And of course, when you get John Weens, Vince Resch, folks like that in the room, there's always some your, your very substantive dialogue. So that was the Independent Science Board. The other thing that happened last week, we uh, hosted a CABA seminar. This is uh, uh, the CABA Center at UC Davis, and as you're aware, we run three or four of these in-depth one-day workshops uh, about three or four times a year. 
And the idea is to pick up on contemporary issues and contemporary topics where people want to get together and have an in-depth discussion you know, outside the agency boundaries. And these are always very well attended. Uh, the, the meeting last week, there was well over 200 people there. And the topic was on YOLO bypass. Uh, and the, the subtitle was YOLO bypass as a reconciled ecosystem. So it was building on the presentation that uh, Christian Elk you gave to the DPIC meeting back in November. Uh, it profiled a lot of the current work that's going on, uh, both at UC Davis, uh, the Nature Conservancy, Department of Water Resources, US Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, Yolo County. And within the audience, what was interesting, it, it wasn't just scientists or planners. That There was uh, elected officials there, there were staffers. It was really quite a nice blend, and that was reflected in the questions. So as with all the CARBA sem seminars, uh, these are recorded on online, so if you're interested to follow that or follow part of it or hear one of the presenters, you can just uh, go to the CARBA webpage or, or get to it through the uh, science program webpage. W one of the most interesting sessions in this, if you haven't heard it before, uh, Jacob Katz and uh, John Brennan. Uh, Jacob's with Cal Trout and John Brennan is with the California Martian Farm uh, Ventures. And they do this really nice tag team one two where they're talking about the agricultural side, the environmental side, and how the, these two things really can be re recon uh, reconciled. So, so I would say that was one, one of the highlights. One of the things that's important about that, of course, is a key restoration action recommended in the Delta Plan is rehabilitation of the Yolo bypass. So this is one of the ways that we can provide the best science to support those restoration actions as well as keep track of the progress, which seems pretty substantial. Isn't that? Under her report, reports about the county finding ways they can begin to uh, sh reshape the restoration so it meets some of their needs and is more compatible with them. Is that true? Yeah, actually, the uh, representative from Yolo County described how they started this process. Uh, and I think her comment was, it wasn't no, it was hell no. <laughs> and then she actually described the process that people have been through where looking at the economics, you're looking at the planning process that's been put in place, you know, how there really is possibility, which is a sort of reconciliation. Um, so, so anyway, just some very interesting discussion there. And of course, the reason the state uh, and the, the council is has so much attention on it is that there really is the sense that some good things can be done through there, particularly as much of the planning is quite advanced. Okay, and as we get on to the other ones, uh, Sam Howard, if you want to c come down, I'll get to that in a moment, but you may want to jump in on some of these issues as well. Um, we promised you we would give you an update of the, the data summit. If you recall, back in June, we started out with you really looking at um, th the future on how we get easy access to data and information. And I think what's transpired in the last few months is really a demonstration of the value of what the council can do. And the reason for that is that if you look across your know, various agencies, NGOs, uh, other entities, many of these agencies have already developed pretty sophisticated data management systems that are directly geared to their missions. And that gets information to their staff. Um, it, you, th that data can be displayed for whether it's developing maps for public meetings, ho however that data is going to be used. But where the challenges come in is that if you're really trying to understand how this system responds, you need to be pulling information from a lot of these data and information sources to, to develop a, a more holistic picture. And that's the first challenge. The, the other is, uh, you, if you follow that um, summit or the regular press, there's, there's this deluge of data. You were moving into this era of big data. And as much as I like the vice chair's definition back in Atlanta for big data, which was a punk rock group out of Los Angeles, I think it was. <laughs> um, w w w w w it was a slogan in the search of funding. <laughs> 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 yeah. 
so I'm not sure that the big data community has actually responded to, to those keynotes, but it's, <laughs> it was certainly a very interesting opportunity to lay out some of the, the challenges. But, but the real challenge is the definition of big data is that when data is coming from many different sources and there's so much of it and the density of that data is so huge, it simply is not possible on many of these issues to even get that data on a single computer. So, so the definition I like is that when you're dealing with data sets that are far too big for one machine, so you're having to go out and connect your databases and be able to download information, uh, subsets of that, so you can actually use it. There's been a, a very, very large number of contributors to the development of this white paper, and the editorial team has been wading through the many contributions f f and comments from the folks who participated in the summit or have got involved since then. Uh, you, we're expecting by the end of the year that there will be a, a, a public draft of this to go out for public comment. And in this white paper, you'll see that it identifies some of the challenges of moving data around across uh, institutional boundaries. It also highlights some of the success stories. You know, there's a lot of very good people looking at this um, particularly around the Bay and the Delta system. The challenge is that those are grant-funded, limited value. So it shows what can be done, but there's questions about how do we make that sustainable in the long term. And it also links with uh, state plans, you know, federal plans that are looking at big data. Uh, of course, the Nature Conservancy and many of the other NGOs are, are also taking a hard look at this. So you'll see it links everything from uh, the executive orders that have come out in the last 18 months related to big data to what is going to be relevant uh, in our system and in California. So as that public draft comes out next time, we'll give a sort of much more uh, detailed overview uh, you know, when that writing team's you got the comments. Are there any questions on that? If not, I'll jump on to the... The, the, the journal. So the December issue of the San Francisco Estuary and Watershed Science Journal um, for, for Mayor Brown, this is actually a journal, an online journal. It's free. Uh, it's actually supported in large part by the council uh, with significant resources from uh, the University of California system. And the idea is in this journal that it's uh, has very rigorous peer review. You know, the acceptance rate is not you know, very high. Uh, very strong uh, uh, editorial board taking a look at this. So in the December version, uh, or this December issue, there's three papers. Uh, the first one is again uh, describing some research funded by the council and others. And it is Produced by Carla Glykoff uh, from Stanford University, with Dr. Wolfram from Los Alamos and the entire Stanford Hydrodynamics Group. And what they were looking at is a very detailed analysis of pulling together all of the field data that's being collected at the um, junction in tidal rivers in the estuary, in the delta. So the idea here was that many of the models and maybe one or two dimensional, but we know that the actual flow structure at some of these bends are, are critical. Particularly, um, not only is it advecting or transporting nutrients, sediments that provide the turbidity where delta smelt are thought to hide in, it also governs things like uh, motion of contaminants. And what this detailed study does is to understand the flow structure in these bends and particularly how it may affect fish and turbidity and other ecological parameters. They use many data sources, uh, primarily from the USGS, but it also uh, used data that was partially um, developed and funded by the council related to the floating sensor network. So if you remember, 18 months ago, there was a lot of press around these Android phones, which were on little floats, and they released a whole bunch of them and then tracked them with GPS to see how the flow actually behaved. 
So what the Stanford group did was to take all of that data and then run a very complex high-resolution 3D model to look at how the refuge areas around these complex junctions behaved under different uh, f flow conditions. And they run, ran these simulations for both uh, open and closed conditions of the delta cross-channel gates. And what they showed was that the, these management actions can have a very significant effect on those flow patterns. So that having laid that out now, the fish biologists can take a look and say, what's really going to favor? If you can keep the smelt on one bank, maybe the far bank under certain flow conditions, they're going to go straight past rather than being pulled into the delta cross channel. So very, very uh, you know, d uh, detailed study getting at the hydrodynamics. The second paper there is developed by the group at the Watershed Sciences Center at UC uh, Davis. And the authors include uh, Lucas Seigfried, uh, Bill Fleener, and uh, Jay Lund, of course, who is the vice chair of the Independent Science Board. And what they were doing here was experimenting. They picked two of the islands for where there was a, f a fair amount of data. And they wanted to get a better handle on the consumptive use within of water within the islands. Because one of the big unknowns I in this system is that even usually the diversions you can get a good handle on because it's, it's at a point. But the actual return flows from agricultural land, how much is lost due to evapotranspiration, how much may disappear into the uh, shallow groundwater I is really a big unknown. And the conclusion of that paper was that really our analytical capabilities in modeling far outstrips the information which we have available to put into the models. So the conclusion was we need to have a much better idea of the resolution of uh, land use on these islands if we're going to get a better handle on the, the water balance. The third paper is a, a paper generated by the Department of Water Resources, which is uh, using a, a, an innovative technology for uh, tracking salmon. And this was a study that was conducted around the Feather River hatchery. Uh, the authors were Michael Mercer and Ryan Kurth. And one of the problems with the hatcheries is how hatchery fish may be interacting with you, the, the wild fish, or the, I think in the paper they referred it to, to natural origin. And it, if you get too much interbreeding of that, it begins to break down some of the genetic structure. So they were looking for tools that would allow them to manage the hatchery um, in, in such a way that, um, th th that this uh, separation of the hatchery stocks and the native origin species can be... Uh, uh, guided. The difficulty is that you need a technique. How do you tell the difference? You, some species it's very evident, you, whether it's a hatchery fish or a, uh, a wild fish in terms of size and other things, but you, in this system it's not possible to do. So they were looking for a low-cost technique that would be able to distinguish the fish. And they did that through um, thermal marking. Basically, they take the hatchery fish and they expose them to much cooler temperatures for a while. And the otolith is that little bone in the ear of the fish. And then they can detect on the return, actually in the rings of the otolith, which look like a tree ring, that the growth is less because of that thermal exposure. And so the paper was documenting this extremely extensive discovery, and the conclusion was that this low-cost technique uh, is, in fact, going to be effective. So th 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 those are the c current journal articles. Um, with a council member, uh, you raised the question to have a, perhaps a more of an update of the numbers, and at the same time, we thought it would be very uh, useful, based on a recommendation by Larry Rustola, to perhaps give an update on El Nino. And so, 
Sam, and I don't know if you want to add anything about the fish story, as you are a fish ecologist, or maybe you'd just like to go on and do the El Nino and by the numbers. Well, um, related to the, um, the otolith marking, the thermal marking otoliths, the, the alternative to that is the current method um, where they actually stick a little coated wire tag, a little tiny stainless steel tag in the fish's nose, and they have to go through a machine and do it, and they can mark about a quarter of the fish at a hatchery doing that. That's the current practice, and it's, it's fairly expensive, and I don't think it helps the fish that much to stick a little wire nose in their nose, so this is an alternative to that, to that technology. So, let's see. Um, on El Nino, uh, we, I seem, we seem to have forgotten about El Nino. Everybody's thinking about drought and the rain, and um, we talked about it a lot a few months ago. Well, El, El Nino conditions are actually here now, and uh, that's measured in, uh, uh, along the equator in the tropical Pacific Ocean. And um, to be in El Nino conditions, uh, the temperature has to be about a half a degree centigrade above uh, normal. And uh, a strong El Nino is up around 2 degrees centigrade, 1.8 to 2. Well, right now we're at 0.9. Um, so those conditions exist in the tropical Pacific. Um, it has to be contain continued for a probably on, on the order of five months or so to be considered an official El Nino. So we'll have to find out sometime in March or so whether we really have an official El Nino or not. But regardless of that, um, it, it really, as we found and in some of the discussions we've brought to the council before, it really doesn't tell us that much about what's going to happen with the water year ahead. So the current climate projections are still uh, even chance. We have an even chance going forward of, of having above or below normal precipitation. And I'll talk a little bit about that in, uh, by the numbers, too, if, if we're ready to go forward with that. Okay, so um, we've had some changes since I, we first sent out the by the numbers with, with your packet 10 days ago, um, which I, I think are uh, interesting. Um, we had a lot of rainfall, so um, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll kind of go through these and talk about some of those changes and maybe an, a, a little bit of a change I added to the numbers too. Um, the two major reservoirs on the um, Central Valley Project and the State Water Project, Shasta and Oroville, uh, I believe in the first uh, edition of this I sent out, uh, Shasta was about 39% of average. It's actually in, in the updated sent out yesterday it was 53, and actually today it's at 54 percent of average, so that's a pretty substantial increase. They both Shasta and Oroville are still only about a third full, so they've got a long way to go, and we'll provide a little bit more detail on that later. Um, river flows are up. Uh, Sacramento River is about twice its typical average December flow right now. It's at 55,000 cubic feet per second. The San Joaquin River is is um, doing better, but it's still a little below average. It's about uh, 1,600 CFS, and it typically runs about 2,700 CFS at this time of year. Uh, delta operations um, are actually um, below what they could be at this time of year. So last week, last Thursday, they were pumping, between the state and federal water project, they were pumping about 10,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, yesterday, they were pumping about 5,800 cubic feet per second. And the reason that those numbers are down is this is actually an experiment that's being conducted by the um, water agencies to see if they can control the movement of, of turbidity across the delta and thereby reduce um, entrainment, potential entrainment of delta smelt and, and long fin smelt. The smelts are this time of year moving into the delta for their spawning, and um, if they're entrained and you lose them at this time of year, it affects the ability. They have there's limits under the Endangered Species Act, and also it, it's hypothesized that that has an impact on their population by kind of catching the spawners before they can reproduce. So um, this is actually a pretty substantial reduction. They said they could be pumping upwards to 10,000 cubic feet per second. 5,000 is, is, is uh, sacrificing quite a bit of water to do this experiment. I, 
On the fish uh, part of the um, by the numbers, I actually changed things up a little bit. Before I was showing you the index numbers that are kind of a measure of population of those fish. And the numbers that are in here now are actually how many fish have been entrained in, at the pumps. So it's, it's, a, it's uh, what they actually pick up at the, at the uh, fish facilities at the state and federal project. And there haven't been any. Um, that's um, probably a good thing. That's why I put green in here. It's, it's, it's a less, um, it's a little bit um, concerning though because it also indicates that maybe there aren't that many smelt out there. That's another part. So it's, it's both a good thing and, 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 and sort of a concern. But it's always good to not train smelt. Um, see, oh, precipitation. I, I didn't talk about that yet. So we've actually done quite well in the last 10 days. Um, Northern Sierra Index is over 20 inches now. That means we're not even, we're starting to move up the ladder for the, uh, as far as water years are concerned, we're, we're above some of the driest years on record already this year, which is, which is um, quite a change. The Southern Sierra Index is catching up. It's doing better, but it's not quite up to average just yet. Let's see, I think I'll, flip it over and take a look at the back. I, I think what I've provided here, this is uh, the top uh, panel on the back of the by the numbers is a chart that's put out by the uh, Department of Water Resources. And this shows kind of a cumulative chart of how we're doing going through the rainfall year. The, the dark blue line on the left, it's got the 20.1 inches label next to it. That's where we are right now. That's the current water year for the Northern Sierra Index. I added two other squiggling lines on here. One of them is for 2012-13, uh, and the other one's for 2005-2006. And I think this can help to illustrate um, the, the fact that going forward, we really don't have a good guess as to where we're gonna wind up. In 2012-13, we were ahead of where we are right now, and we ended up below average. In 2005-2006, we were below where we are now, and we ended up way ahead. So. Um, going forward, um, you know, your best guess is always going to be that we're going to have average rainfall for the rest of the year, but we just have to wait and see. Um, in the bottom panel, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about how much impact the rainfalls had on the um, water supply, and I think this kind of, kind of helps to illustrate it. So this is the, the, the storage in Lake Oroville, and it shows this is a one-year period of time, so it shows uh, starting on the left is where we were last year, uh, probably about 1.3 or so a million acre feet at this time of year. And reservoir rose up to uh, 1.9, 1.8 something acre, million acre feet, and then dropped down to below 900,000 acre feet in the driest part of the year. And we've just started, you know, climbing the hill to, to fill that reservoir, but we've got a long way to go. So this is still, this reservoir is still only a third full. Uh, full capacity reservoir would actually be half, about three quarters of the way up the page. So we've still got a ways to go to even get to where we were starting last year's dry year. Um, so um, I just think it helps to kind of put it in perspective a little bit. Questions for Sam? Phil? Sam, I, I had caught the ship. No, there you are. I'd caught the shift uh, from uh, uh, troll data to uh, uh, to the salvage stuff. I mean, they're measuring different things or different right. locations. Right. Uh, but I wonder whether you shouldn't consider adjusting the fish chart to show both each report period, because otherwise, mm -hmm. uh, you know, you you get a kind of a simplistic view that because there's no delta smelt or long thing smelt mm -hmm. being found in salvage that it must mm -hmm. mean that the pumps can be operated at the highest possible level without any damage. Footnote, all of a sudden, all the striped bass in the entire delta are found entrained uh, <laughs> in the, as a result of the pumps. Which I, th I just, it was just an odd juxtaposition. Well, I, I added the striped bass numbers to show that fish were actually being entrained, even though they're not the ones we're really that concerned about. Uh, that number for striped bass is actually kind of on the low side. Uh, and oftentimes, the numbers for striped bass, juvenile striped bass, are in the uh, tens of thousands. Um, mm -hmm. 
for the same period of time. So, well, the, um, a couple but you're, I agree. We these need these numbers need some explanation. And, and it uh, the sh the shift in the chart in a two week period I think was important to do, but it also points out the problems with looking at a monthly report without any longitudinal information, without a history and a pattern and so on. And I wonder whether you can't figure out a way to simultaneously give us the, the, the latest information mm -hmm. on all of these categories, but also something that could be judged more meaningfully. On, mm -hmm. on the water storage, of mm -hmm. course, it's a different thing, but you've got a historic average to apply against. I don't know, there are always arguments about whether that's a rational use, but at least mm -hmm. it's a, a way to judge. Uh, there aren't other judgments that are comparable, and the chart could become, without being overly complicated, might become more useful and interesting mm -hmm. if you could somehow figure out a way to format the information and include historical averages for a comparison. I could. There, I, I've had a couple of thoughts about how to, how to do that. One would be to maybe provide some more backup documentation for these numbers if you wanted to dig into it a little further with the report, so that there's kind of a cover page and then some more background information with it. Um, the other approach might be, and, and I'll leave this uh, to the council if this is what you'd like to do, but would be to have have the by the numbers maybe focus on a particular issue each month and uh, provide a more in-depth discussion on you know some of the fish or environmental issues or water supply I mean um, well I, I don't I don't want to I don't want to make a definitive judgment but my reservation about attachments to explain a chart is a way of saying the chart can't explain itself. And so here's the additional information, which if you read it carefully, you might be able to. So the value of this is it's, in the water world, it's almost understandable. Right. And, and that makes it of great utility to policymakers. And so I don't, want, I don't want to jeopardize that. Just a suggestion. Okay. If you view the by the numbers on page one as kind of your summary, something that will be eventually on our website as a dashboard of successes or failures or, or something, you might consider using the back page as the variant information so you could uh, do, hist you know, you, you, you mm -hmm. could have, for example, mm -hmm. uh, explain the difference between troll data and uh, 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 entrainment figures and given a historic chart that might have helped in the understanding of the of the summary so okay. and keep the keep the near understandability of the front page and limit the back page supplemental information as best you can to one page okay i think you probably would do better okay all right there's a suggestion larry just <coughs> just so people don't think i only think of weeds um <coughs> At the weed meeting yesterday, one of the things that came up was that at the pumps, there is a huge amount of water hyacinth that has to be like pulled out of that, uh, that canal so that the water can be exported. And one of the things they talked about at Bureau of Reclamation individual was that they don't have a good figure on the fish because they're pulling out these huge amounts of water hyacinth, putting them in trucks mm -hmm. and then dumping them over mm -hmm. to dry out on land. So mm -hmm. they're missing, they're probably missing some of the fish are, mm -hmm. are getting pulled and mm -hmm. taken. And there's just no way. So that's another example. Uh, uh, back in, uh, we have a picture back in 2011 when you had a good water year, uh, the Bureau took, uh, over 2,000 truckloads of water hyacinth in December out of that particular canal. I think if you look at it today, it's as bad or worse than it was then. So it would be interesting to know what is the cost that the state and the federal government expend at the pumps to get rid of these, or at least make it so they can export water, and two, how much water 
is actually wrapped up in a water hyacinth in acre feet. If you've got if you've got a, a plant that's 90 or 95 percent water, and it's completely covering the south and central delta or the western delta, how what kind of water are we losing to the export pumps to the farmers in the south or the cities? That no one can answer that figure. We kind of took a guess at it, but it would be interesting if somebody knew that. Thank you. Thank you for that. Dan? Sam, I, I noticed that while all the numbers for, are, seem to be moving in a healthy direction between the, the report that was distributed through the packet and the one that we got today, the one set of numbers that actually seems to have gone south a little bit is salinity, if my colorblindness isn't deceiving me, that actually the salinity at the pumps and in the San Joaquin River has actually increased, even though discharges have increased at the same time. And it's a puzzle to me. Do you have an explanation? Well, I have sort of an explanation. Um, um, that's a good observation because um, part of the explanation is that um, it takes a while to move salty water out of the South Delta. It's, it, you know, that flow of fresh water that just started in the North Delta, it takes a while for that to move across and get to the pumps. And the only way water really gets out of the South Delta is through pumping, uh, you know, some tidal action, but it usually just has to get pumped out. So that's part of the explanation. The other one is on the San Joaquin River side, it's every December, even into January, this seems to happen. And I, I, I can check on it, but I think the best guess is, is that when you start getting rainfall on the agricultural lands where there's salinity in the soils and there's agricultural runoff in the, in the San Joaquin Valley, that, that rainfall at the beginning of the rainy season starts moving some of that salt out into the San Joaquin River. And it seems to happen every year about this time. I noticed that you know, a number of years ago and they had the same kind of question as to why that happens. And I know we have a great explanation, but it happens every year. Okay. Judge? Um, I just want to underscore the recommendation of the vice chair. I, I think the snapshot is one thing, but a longer view is much more important to us to know where we're going up or down and mm -hmm. a sense of the, okay. the uh, history I think is really key to make this meaningful for us. Okay. Yeah, I, I point taken. I know we've We've been through this before, and we forget about providing some of that. They're doing a good job on the context, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep at it. That's good. It's work in progress. Peter, did you have a comment? No. No, I think that's... Sam, I wanted to provide a little amplification to the comments you made about the reduction in the export pumping. Mm -hmm. um, you you um, indicated the CFS reduction. I think, if uh, memory serves me well from recent reading, the reduction in pumping represents about 8,000 acre feet a day that uh, the export pumps are foregoing. And I, I want to highlight this because I think it's mm -hmm. an example of adaptively managing the system. This is voluntary on their part. They're not required to do this, but they've learned from experience that they pull that turbidity into the south, it may in, induce smelt to be present in the pumps, mm -hmm. thus resulting in a complete termination of exports for a period of time. Mm -hmm. So um, as one who has been caught flat-footed in front of a large <laughs> audience asking for examples of effective adaptive management, I wanted to take this opportunity to highlight this as uh, what I think is an example in our midst of uh, adaptively managed system. I, no, I agree. It, it, it is kind of a big deal. You know, 8,000 acre feet is worth a lot of money, and, and so this is not a trivial uh, experiment at all. It, it takes some courage to make that kind of change to flow in the system because somebody is losing out on um, good supply of water. So. Other comments or questions of Sam? Peter? Uh, perhaps just to add a uh an additional comment to that, I think the additional monitoring that's being done under the drought to pick up these phenomena, a lot's going to be learned. Mm -hmm. So particularly with the early warning uh, stations which have been added, you, mm -hmm. it'll be very easy to see the effectiveness of that uh, measure. Okay, Sam, thank you very much.
Okay. Uh, any public comment regarding the lead scientist report? No? Moving on then. Uh, I think we're on to file item number seven. This is an action item, endorsement of the Delta Levy Investment Strategy issue paper. And we have Cindy Messer and Dustin Jones that will be uh, facilitating this discussion. And, and just by way of introduction, what, what we're really seeking today is for you all to say, you know what, this levy investment strategy, which is really an issue identification a document to try to make sure that we've identified properly the issues you want to make sure are addressed as we proceed with the levy investment strategy, to make sure that it properly identifies those issues and it's an acceptable place to start. We haven't laid out any policy recommendations we're asking you to endorse. We're not uh, setting any direction now. Those are actions that will happen uh, beginning in the next quarter as we uh, anticipate the, the just continuing to work with our consulting team. So uh, Cindy will, will walk us through this, but I want to make, make it clear that that's what we're seeking today, not endorsement necessarily, but acceptance. Good enough for now. Welcome, Cindy. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. So definitely that's a good lead into um, our report today. So this is the monthly update for the levy investment strategy, as Dan has mentioned. Our focus today is bringing back the Delta levy investment issue paper. And just very quickly, as a reminder, maybe to those who haven't been following for the last few months, um, we brought a draft of the paper before the council in September, received your feedback and suggestions, and then promptly opened up a public comment period, which lasted through the end of October. We received some comments through that process. I'm going to let Dustin walk through those in just a minute. But what we've done since that time is to take your feedback, take public comment, incorporate as appropriate into the draft paper, make some revisions. And what we're bringing back today is what we hope is a final draft of the paper. And as Dan mentioned, we are looking for your consideration, obviously discussion and any feedback the council can offer or would like to offer today. And your acceptance, if indeed that's where we end up um, at the end of this presentation. And what that would do is help us as staff finalize the paper and move into some next steps, which I'll talk about in just a few minutes. Um, with that, so I'll let Dustin take a sip of water and um, unless there's any questions right now, what I, th I think we'll do is walk you through very quickly uh, the comments we received from the public, as well as revisions that we've made to the paper, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Okay, thanks, Cindy. Uh, for the intention of kind of walking through comments, just uh, with respect to time, I won't go into too much level of detail in the individual comments unless the council wishes to kind of dive into that. I'll try to keep the comment discussion at more of a high level. Then if we want to get into more details, we certainly can. Um, but as Cindy mentioned, uh, we closed the paper comments on October 27th. We received eight comment letters uh, in regards to the issue paper. They were from the California Central Valley Flood Control Association, the Central Delta Water Agency, Contra Costa Water District, Department of Fish and Wildlife, Department of Water Resources, local agencies of the North Delta, National Marine Fisheries Service, and the state water contractors. So just as a high level overview of the type of comments we received, um, some of them were just basic edits to the paper, clarifications, um, maybe some, I don't think there were any typos fortunately, but a lot of clarification type issues and um, additional discussion on certain items that people wanted to see. Um, some of the comments that were within the entire matrix that we received were actually geared a little bit more towards the Delta Levy investment strategy that we're working on. So that's something that we're trying to keep in mind through our public outreach and stakeholder meetings. We're trying to make more of a clear distinction on, as Cindy described, uh, the purpose of the issue paper and Dan alluded to also how this kind of forms the questions that will need to be addressed. And then the project that this is leading into where some of the questions will be answered, the Delta Levy investment strategy. So that's something that we were keeping in mind as we were going through separating out the comments, which ones specifically dealt with the issue paper and which ones did we need to keep in mind and kind of on our radar as we're going through the Delta Levy investment strategy. Um, and there were some just a general comments uh, for further scientific analysis to be used as we're developing the Delta Levy investment strategy. One of the items that we've been 
saying as we go out to the public outreach meeting as part of the Delta Levy Investment Strategy Project is that we're using the best available existing data. And so we did receive some comments that there should be further scientific analysis to be done that would be beneficial as we're going through the Delta Levy Investment Strategy development. So those are items that we'll have to consider as the project proceeds with those. Um, so to just kind of boil it down after we've gone through. Well, on, on that point, uh, what, what would that mean? more scientific investigation? Well, some of the assumptions, I guess, that were mentioned within the issue paper, um, off the top of my head, I'd, there was one, um, someone made a comment on the 55-inch sea level rise uh, that was mentioned in the issue paper. And so folks wanted to see, I think, a more in-depth analysis of whether or not that number is actually um, accepted or the source of the number. Uh, so that was just kind of one I can think of off the top of my head. And maybe can I add just oh, very quickly to yeah. um, under sort of that umbrella of comments related to, to science and, and integration of best available information, there were also a few comments that came out regarding, and, and we've heard this as well in some of the outreach meetings, that um, the way the Delta Levy investment strategy is set up right now, we have the science policy interface really occurring through the independent scientific peer review process of the methodology for the levy investment strategy. So some of the comment commenters were asking for more integration of, of scientific review and expertise all the way through the process. So not only teeing up and discussing some of the issues in the issue paper itself, but how that discussion leads into informing the levy investment strategy process. So, it, so there were some specifics in terms of science and, and information, but also this this uh, comment or request to to have more science policy interface as we walk through the whole process. So, just to add a little bit more to that. Thanks, Cindy. Does that help at all? It doesn't. <laughs> Enough for now. Continue while he's processing. Sure, we can, we, we can follow it. So as a result of that, we've been putting together this uh, kind of a response matrix. Um, I believe a similar one was done with the Delta plan where we go through and kind of pull out the comments and we've been formulating responses for each one and accounting for those. Um, we're going through some iterations on those just to make sure we're addressing all the comments properly and taking everything into account. And our intention is to make that public. We just need to work through some of the language of it just to make sure we're addressing everything properly. And we will, our goal is to put that out there. So after the, all the comments, so um, the paper that you see before you that was uh, submitted as part of the attachment, after we've gone through and uh, accounted for most of the comments that were specifically addressed to the levy issue paper, I'll just touch on some of the more significant changes that were made. Um, we've revised some of the discussion of the improvement cost for levy improvements. Uh, there was some discussions on um, whether or not the estimates were too high or um, reasonable estimates for levy improvements. So we've revised some of that discussion. We've also added a table four discussion of levy improvement costs that have been estimated through previous um, reports and then also some of the feedback that we've got from um, local stakeholders also was uh, added in with a description of there of how reasonable those cost estimates were. We also added um, two chronology tables. One was more of a brief chronology of significant Delta events. And that was geared more towards showing some of the items or significant events that have occurred in the Delta along with some of the agency responses or reports that were developed as a result of those or um, following some of those significant events. And then there's also a more thorough chronology that was added at the end of the appendix. Uh, there was kind of an accumulation of um, different events gathered from other reports um, that the state and federal offices had put together. And also, the other item I guess I'll just try to touch on, we tried to add a more clear distinction between uh, two programs that we heavily discuss uh, within the issue paper. The, the Both of them are the DWRS programs, the Delta Levies Maintenance and Subventions Program, and their Special Projects Program. Both of those are run by DWR as a way of funding uh, maintenance and improvements for levies and other projects uh, within the Delta. So we went through and with some feedback from DWR staff and also other stakeholders, we went through and tried to better draw a distinction between those two programs and what their intentions and purposes are. 
And the last item I'll just touch on is that we tried to add some additional text um, with discussion of habitat considerations within the paper. We had some comments that we didn't have enough discussion of, say, for example, terrestrial habitat and other items within there. So we tried to broaden those discussions also. Uh, those are the main ones I'll touch on. Um, unless we want to go into more detail other than that, do we want to do next steps? No, Maybe uh, we should open it open up, up for, for now, questions. Yes. At this point, does anyone have any uh, questions of Dustin? I, wanna, I don't know. I don't, I'm sorry, Susan. Susan and then Phil. Did, did any commenters um, ask about the 2006 floods and, and why they weren't included in the chronology or? No. I, do, I don't think so. I don't think anybody, well, the chronology events were actually added after the comments oh, were received, okay. so we didn't receive a specific comment to that. Um, okay. If it's not in there, that was possibly it, just you know, an oversight. No, the, the, you know, the, the, this, the chronology was added in response um, to Councilmember Johnson's request for information about the flood events that had then triggered subsequent right. state initiatives. So it's easy to see the relationship, for example, between the flood that inundated Ilton uh, in the early 70s in the beginning of the Delta Levy program. I see. Or between the um, failure, the, the disasters in Louisiana at Katrina and the uh, reformation of the Central Valley Flood Protection Board and, and the Project Levy initiatives and state, water, uh, state plan of flood control initiatives and that law. But I, the more recent flooding, I think it's harder to see, okay, yeah, that's how that ties in. Yeah. Triggered to some policy change? Or, yeah. Okay, yeah. I get it. Thank you. I, I, I'm just, I just may want to make a couple of comments. I think they're mainly in terms of clarification, grammar, stuff like that. But I, I went through the red line copy. Mm -hmm. That was just easier for me to, to do. Uh, and I'll refer by page. Page three is your introduction and problem statement in the memo, which I think is quite good. The one thing that's missing from this is even a ballpark estimate of the amount of money that has been spent by local authorities during the same time period. Mm -hmm. And I understand, uh, you know, there's always an argument the information isn't there and so on, but the controller does an annual report. Uh, I, I mean, can't we get a ballpark figure on that? Uh, it just seems to me it's logical to talk about the state investment, but if you don't also talk about some ballpark figure on the local investment, you just lack understanding. Um, then... If you turn to page nine, um, I was puzzled about the, the new language you included, uh, which occurs on lines eight, nine, and 10. And it reads, during extreme flood event, Delta levees convey flood water from Sacramento River, San Joaquin, Katsumas, McCullough, Calaveras, Stanislaus River through the Delta. But then the, the clause at the end, to protect the public and assets and mim minimize damage. Now, I suppose you mean to protect the public assets and minimize damage, but it isn't clear. Mm. And it, it, it just, it's just an odd little clause. I just couldn't immediately understand it. Well, of course, you know, these are project levies, so they've been approved under a f the federal uh, flood control law which the state refers to in, in its uh, criteria for flood control projects too, that requires simply that the benefits to whomever they may accrue exceed the cost. So that includes both private benefits, the protection of property, the avoidance of disrupted uh, business, as well as the public benefits that the Delta Levy investment strategy in terms of the way the uh, the Reform Act instructs us is supposed I'm to not, emphasize. I'm not with that, but yeah. the, as written, the sentence isn't clear to me on what you're trying to make as a point. Um, well, the, the wording's different in my copy from what you read. I think so, what you have in your report is. Yeah, what, the final. what happened is the, the packet included the old report. I mean, the, the new report with the red line changes made but not highlighted. The staff memo which I kind of stumbled across, had a reference of saying the red line version is available on the web, but it's not in your packet, which I think was probably, probably should have been the other way around. Mm -hmm. uh, I should think that should have been in the packet. But, uh, Pat, I don't think it's, you know, I don't, I, I don't think they're, 
there are major fundamental changes that I found on the red line stuff. But uh, uh, anyway, that's what I was talking about. Uh, I, I found the, the, the long chronology to be extraordinarily useful. You've got it now as Appendix A or something like mm -hmm. that. Yeah. I was a little puzzled about the elements that contained within Table 3, which is the, I believe, extracting pieces from the longer chronology and highlighting them in a new text. Yeah. I mean, it just, it just, I, I didn't go through and determine that every entry on Table 3 is also appearing in Appendix A, but logically that would be one was, I saw. They were pretty much it taken from summary. Yeah. It just, it, it was, I, I don't know, it was just harder to understand. On the other hand, the information was just terrific. Uh, okay. And I commend you for that. There's a, um, on page 19 and also on uh, uh, elsewhere in the report, when you change the dollar figures of estimate levy upgrades, these were largely responding to uh, DWR's submission of revision of estimate figures? No, there was actually an error in there where we had uh, um, summed the numbers up, whereas they should have actually been a comparison of the numbers. Because basically both estimates were for similar work, so what we had accidentally done was actually summed two sources of estimates for similar work instead of comparing those sources of estimates. If, so it was double counting. If that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Uh, page 23 under the caption that reads, what level of delta levy improvements, uh, improvement is warranted? I, 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 just, I just stopped at the, what is it, I'm, seconds. I'm, I'm sorry, what page was that? Page 23. 23, okay. In the report. So, uh, a number is eight with a caption, what level of de delta levy, okay. The sentence that starts at line 22, the Delta plan acknowledges that eliminating flood risks is impossible, but they can be significantly reduced by blah, 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 blah. I paused at two things. Um, don't you want to say eliminating all flood risk is impossible? And secondly, is significantly the right word? Because in fact, some of the Delta plan recommendations would only modestly reduce flood risk. I mean, I just, Again, I, I couldn't, couldn't puzzle my way through that. Um, page 28, under item subtitled 11, what condition should be attached to state funding of levies, which I thought was an interesting discussion. That would be on page 26 of your comment. Is it 26 of your, sorry about that. 26. Mm -hmm. There's a sentence you've added <laughs> that isn't a sentence. Depending on the needs of the, of the state and priorities approved by the Central Valley Flood Protection Board, period. I couldn't figure out what that, I think it relates to the previous sentence, but for the life of me, I cannot tell. That was the intention. Yeah, I'll have to look through that and see if it was, uh, yeah, and if I could smooth that out a little bit. The next sentence seems to tie to that. This may change, and I assume that this, well, I don't know what the this is. This may change considering the passage of Prop 1E, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it, again, this is grammatical, but it's to, just to clarify it, I'd recommend you take a look at that uh, information. Um, I don't know, I don't know, Randy, I'm on point number 14 which is page 30 on the red line version. Page 28. Okay, page, I'm sorry, point 13. Uh, you, you have a, a last sentence in uh, what if local agencies don't act section, 27. and it now reads, however, one in the pocket neighborhood of Sacramento funds state maintenance of project levies there. One what? You know, I, I think what's happened is the, the track changes version that you looked at doesn't fully reflect the last minute edits that were done in the clean copy. That <laughs> okay. There's some confusion well, then you that was done, and so I think we need to clean that part up. Yeah, okay. okay. Page 28. Well, when we, when we do the red line change, I, I just like to make a suggestion. I, I tend to look, I mean, I read the original document when it came to us two months ago or three mm -hmm. months ago. Uh, I've got notes on that. but. I wanted to see the changes, mm -hmm. and I, I think you've got to give us the changes in the packet 
so we can read them. Okay. 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 Thank you. And and maybe a, I will add to that. Just reiterate that the red line version is available on our website, um, and it's under the Delta Levy Investment right. Strategy Project. So, not for you, but for everyone else. So. Mm -hmm. Other comments, questions? Um, I just Susan. I think what I'll do is is give you m my uh, comments, um, but I do have a question on page nine, uh, the same uh, on line seven, eight, and nine, um, the, the text that, that uh, Vice Chair Eisenberg mm -hmm. referred to uh, on the levees conveying flood water uh, point. It, it prompted me to wonder if there is discussion anywhere in the document about the, the uh, the idea that these levees are constantly holding back water, and also the sunny day levee failure on Jones Tract. As far as the Jones Tract, we do mention that one in there as part of the one of the cost estimates that was mentioned in the paper. I don't know if there's anything where we specifically mention the where the Delta levees are holding water constantly. We've heard the yeah. phrase quite a bit that they're the hardest working levees in the country, right. but I don't yeah. know if we've made that reference in there. I don't think it was in there. Yeah. It's okay. okay. That's a good point. Thank you. All right, Thank others? So, Cindy, okay. proceed. Okay, well, um, shall I ask for the consideration, adoption at this point, if, or acceptance, I'm sorry, let me get if, the right word if, here, or if, should I talk a little bit about next steps? Why don't, why don't we deal with the issue paper first, and then if that's, if you find it's acceptable, and you may want to hear if there's members of the public that mm -hmm. are interested, and okay. then we can uh, wrap up the remaining our discussion of what the next steps are, because the All issue right. paper is certainly the key item of business here. Yes. With the focus on the issue paper, any further comments or questions from the council members? Do we have any public comments? Thank you. Eric Rinkelberg, welcome. Hello. Eric Rinkelberg, Local Agencies of the North Delta, Coalition of 18 Reclamation and Water Districts in the Northern Delta. So, I appreciate the uh, dedication of the council and the staff. Um, towards working on this issue of critical importance to us and our communities. Um, we greatly appreciate the Council's expedited approach towards this process, as they do through most of these processes, um, in clear contradiction to the normal Delta process, which is forever multi-generational. Um, but I'm going to request that um, you hold this the issue paper um, until the next Council meeting, and, and I don't do that um, without understanding some of the repercussions of that, but I think um, there are a couple issues that we feel are critical concern that have not really been addressed in this. And we understand that the issue paper is not supposed to be this overarching perfect document. We don't, we don't expect that, and, and we think the staff have done an excellent job of getting us pretty far down that road. But we feel there's a couple issues that the district engineers need to hash out um, with staff to get a firmer understanding, and, and whether that information is put into the issue paper, which is our hope, or not, we still think these things need to be uncovered and discussed before uh, it goes final. Um, we'd like this issue paper to articulate something that's beyond the existing processes. And so when you're in the weeds uh, in these issues with Delta levies, we have several existing processes. The CORS process would already articulate uh, environmental conservation benefits, uh, water uh, resource protection for the south pumps, as well as local risk. Um, that process is in existence. It was updated in 2014. Uh, uh, the work was done in 2013. We'd like, like to see some of those um, technical analyses uh, included in the issue paper for one illustration. So there's a variety of things that, that we think from a technical perspective would strengthen the paper, and we urge the council to, to hold back on its release until we can meet with the team before the next council meeting. I, did, I must confess, tell me again what technical papers 
what process the technical papers are a part of? Sure. So under the existing programs, under subventions and um, uh, project levy pro stuff. The, the project levy side, um, we already have to meet these criteria. There's an existing uh, risk analysis and articulation process for those that every project that receives funding has to go through already, both on the state side and the federal side. And what we'd like to do is flesh some of those details out in the issues paper so that the issue if, paper. If, if it's already a requirement of either federal law or state law or regulation, what does flesh out mean? A proper understanding of the application of the federal law and state law? Have the issue paper better reflect the elements that already exist that the districts already have to follow? Um, I think you find if you start holding these side by side that we already have a pretty substantive system that matches fairly closely the requirements that the issue paper says that we're going to analyze now again and follow. So you want a declaration that the existing federal law, state law, satisfies all the requirements? I did not say no. that. No. Okay. Then tell me again. So I would, I would like to have those uh, existing state and federal requirements articulated clearly in this document. And then ideally, I'd like to see how the proposed approach differs and looking at the strengths and weaknesses of uh, the existing programs and how this approach might be a better benefit to protecting those three different core values. You understand this is a staff memo. It is not a proposed amendment to the Delta plan. You do understand that? I understand. Yes, absolutely. And this is designed to satisfy the statutory mandate of us recommending an investment strategy for the state of California. But you want to work out all the details in a staff memo? No, I, I, I just don't. I, I have no interest or intention of trying to work out all those details. That's for the future process. What I'd like to do is get an articulation of the existing conditions. Okay. Looks like we have one more blue slip. That's what they call good timing. I'm <laughs> Melinda on my part. Terry just barely got here in I time to take I? her coat off and <laughs> fill out the blue form. Uh, Melinda Terry, uh, California Central Valley Flood Control Association. Um, and uh, in terms of the white paper, uh, we thought it was a pretty good start, um, uh, but uh, we did make some extensive comments. So, uh, but addressing kind of how the end of that conversation just went on the, the last, on Eric being up here, you know, obviously these are things that we want to work on moving forward um, in the process since it's still really at the beginning. Um, I would say probably one of our bigger things is that as we move forward, we're just really being um, uh, aware of not making uh, the ability for the local uh, maintaining agencies, the reclamation districts, who are the ones that primarily do all the designing and planning, and, and they're also the ones that then go out and get the locals to vote for the assessment to get the local cost share to match with the state portion to not make it more difficult for them um, in accessing some of the programs or just creating extra regulatory burdens and hurdles for them to go over. Um, because the my members who are reclamation districts in the Delta are definitely smaller, tend to have the smaller budgets compared to some of my other members, um, other than our urban centers like Stockton and West Sacramento. They obviously have larger budgets. so. Um, that hopefully will be a really important primary goal um, moving forward. In terms of some of the um, bigger comments that we made was, uh, if you look at the white paper as kind of a scoping document, we were a little bit concerned because it is primarily relying on two reports that have much uh, uh, more outdated information compared to some more recent reports. So we did recommend some other reports to look at, including the um, economic sustainability plan is actually has more current data, but even that is slightly outdated now. There's new information. And um, the other thing, uh, one of the other things that we really pointed out was it, it seemed like there was a little bit of um, selective representation, if you will, and, and, and missing context. So, and it, and, it, and it flipped both ways, actually. So interestingly, on the one hand, there was lots of examples where it seemed to um, be really uh, focusing on a negative context of what's going on and not focus and explaining and disclosing a lot of the positive things. 
And um, so, for example, I, you know, we've actually, since the implementation of the Delta Subventions Program in 1973, and, and part of that reason was to try to get up the Delta up to a Delta PL8499 standard, and the state signed an MOU with the federal government saying that, yeah, we're going to get towards that. And they knew it would take time. We've recently made a lot of progress in that, and I think we might be farther along than what you even think, and part of the reason is because of Proposition 1E. I mean, that was over $4 billion, and a lot of that money was available to the Delta. You know, in the Delta subventions, they spend about $12 million a year, so we're, we've made a lot more progress than you might think. But then on the flip side, sometimes it was overly optimistic in terms of maybe the feasibility of things that might be able to be done. And it's okay to mention those things, but let's not be overly optimistic. Let's be realistic in what the expectations are that we're setting up for the Delta community, for yourselves as a council to try to make progress and just for the state as a whole. So the examples there would be the um, vegetation, for instance. While the federal legislation, the WERDA bill, um, our congressional delegation was successful in getting language in there, um, and partly it was due to a lawsuit the environmental organizations have brought against the Army Corps' vegetation policy. Um, there's language in that bill to have the Army Corps review their guidelines. Okay, and they give them two specific things they have to review. <clears throat> Doesn't say they have to change them and thou shalt do this. So at the end of that, while we get a reprieve, and so during that review, we get a reprieve. They're not enforcing the vegetation. But that's like a year and a half. It's a very temporary thing. We don't know what will happen at the end. So to pretend as if um, overly optimistic then is we can do vegetation on 20 linear miles in a lot of, on project levies anyway. We can do it on the other levies, but not on the project levies, potentially. So it's a little bit of flip side, like I said, on that. Um, again, we would encourage uh, looking at some more recent um, reports. And then finally, I guess, if you're looking at a scoping document, the other thing is for a strategy, a strategy is all about making knowing decisions, putting things up there so that, because choices do have to be made, particularly for the state when it comes to state investments. And let's face it, the most important thing if you're the state and really as a taxpayer is maximizing the dollar. The thing we don't want to see is you spend a dollar for um, you know, the actual flood improvement on one levy mile, then you come back and you spend another dollar, state dollar, on, to do the environmental, then you come back on the same one levy mile. We don't want to do that. We want to try to maximize it as best we can. But the problem is, is I think in a strategy, you really need to know where you're going to end up, what you want that system, that flood system, to look like in the delta at the end. And that does mean identifying what kind of standards that you might want in the different areas, because you may not have one standard fit all areas. And we know that, for instance, because the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan requires the urban centers in the Delta and everywhere in the, else in the Central Valley to reach a 200 level. So you're going to have to recognize that in your prioritization, that those urban levies are going to have to get to a higher standard than our rural um, levies. All of those things need to be put out there because we're going to have conflicts. You need to, so in a strategy, the goal is to kind of really identify what are the benefits of reaching this levy standard versus this levy standard. What are the consequences of reaching this levy standard versus this levy standard? You know, PL8049 is the perfect example. The benefits are you get a higher uh, geotechnical engineering flood protection to save property and lives. Another benefit that you get potentially is the federal government paying 100% of repair if there's a failure on that project levy. The problem is the Army Corps has a cost-benefit ratio that they do. So even if a Delta levy district meets PL8499, which I'm not aware of any of them that do, <laughs> um, because of encroachments and vegetation um, being big issues, other system problems as well. But if they did, they may not meet the cost-benefit and they'll get zero dollars, because our Army Corps will say, sorry. So then you ask yourself, well, okay, is that the standard we want on all the levies? Because if you're not trying to meet that PL8499 and there's other opportunities, you might be able to do vegetation on that levy to meet the other goals that you've identified. But those are the kind of choices, but you have to first figure out what are those benefits and what are the consequences, so that when you make that choice, it's a knowing choice. 
So I'll just end there and we look forward to working with you as you move forward. Thank you. Great, thank you, Melinda. So staff is recommending council's acceptance of the final draft issue paper, the Delta Levy investment issue paper. Randy, after this discussion, I think I would like to hear a little bit about next steps uh, before we uh, vote on this um, to be certain that issues unaddressed or issues in dispute or more information that can come in um, would not be inadvertently precluded by taking an action today. So maybe you, you could speak a little to what happens after this. That sounds like a, a good approach. Okay. Cindy, next sure. steps. Um, so let me just start with again that um, the issue paper is a framework for discussion. And so what the next steps would be is to begin to tee up some of the key, a subset of those 15 questions or key issues that are in the paper to bring to the council for discussion, deliberation, consideration, and, and some feedback and guidance to the staff. And so what we're envisioning is in the first quarter of this new year is we would begin to use this part of the update in the council meetings to start to, as staff, tee up the questions have a discussion around these bigger picture policy questions. Also to be able to bring in some additional expertise, and that's where this, we're thinking the science policy interface type um, interactions would occur. I think, um, you know, Melinda actually brings up some good points. I think through these discussions, it gives us an opportunity to look at different existing information, some of the references that she has provided to us. Um, that maybe aren't specifically mentioned in the issue paper, but of course could be part of a discussion um, with the council, bringing in, again, additional experts um, that maybe the council members identify there are certain areas or certain topics they'd like to dive down into a little bit more. We as staff could identify some additional individuals to bring in to have that discussion, to offer some additional information and thoughts. Um, we, in the staff report, have teed up six questions that we think are the ones that need to be addressed sooner than later with the council. What it'll do is it's a couple different things. It's information that's the bigger picture, objectives, it feeds into the strategy and that discussion as we're developing the levy investment strategy. It helps to inform the levy investment strategy project, helps to inform the consultants in terms of the technical work they're doing. And some of these questions, obviously, will need to be revisited through the whole process. But um, I, I can read through them, but we've included them in the staff report. And of course, there's some of the bigger um, questions that Melinda has raised and others, and what are the objectives, state interests. So really, really having that discussion around confirming what those are, defining those, and then that moves us along to developing the strategy. So that would be. All right. Judge? Yeah, so what you're saying is the, the issues presented in this paper do not preclude the discussion that we just heard regarding expanded issues and other considerations. This, this is silly, really an, uh, a starting point in a sense. Is yes. that correct? Yes. Yeah, it's a framework, and of course we can right. go where we need to with each of these issues. Okay. I think our, our, our key concern, uh, and this was initially uh, you know, a response uh, Council Eisenberg's uh, admonition that we not get down in the details before we understand the big picture mm -hmm. and how the detail work that our consulting team is going to help us address actually helps um, answer the, the core questions that underlie the strategy. So uh, particularly the things we want to front load are things on which the direction from the Council is really important early so we can make sure the consultants are focusing on the things that are of core interest of yours. And obviously you're gonna be hearing from the public as you give us that direction. Um, it's, so that's how the system works. And I think some of the additional detail that folks have asked for, for example, like let's make sure we understand the financial contributions of local districts. And one of the key questions is to get, gather more information about how maintenance and improvement of levies is funded now, so we can bring more of that information for the, to the table, for example. And if that shows us there's something else we have to look at, because we didn't anticipate it today, we'll have to look at it, because at the end of the day, you all have got to be satisfied, and I'm sure you're going to be listening to others, that the proposals we're recommending are appropriate additions to the Delta Plan. What's your pleasure? I'll move it. 
Eisenberg moves, Johnston seconds. Any discussion? We shall begin with the vote, beginning with Mayor Brown. Yes. Aye. Here, any aye? Eisenberg, aye. Bruce Dollar, aye. Motion passes unanimously. Uh, any, anything else? Um, maybe just very quickly, we'll touch upon some of the other activities that we've been working on around the levy investment strategy over the last month. Uh, I think I just really wanted to focus on the public outreach meeting that we had last week. As you recall, we actually had two scheduled for last week, one in Clarksburg, one in Brentwood. But due to the big storm, we postponed the Brentwood meeting. Um, that is rescheduled for January 6th, so we will have that. But uh, the purpose of the, this first public meeting was to provide an overview and information about the levy investment strategy, about the work the council is undertaking, uh, a bit about why we're doing it, um, our thoughts for how we'll do it. And then what we really wanted to do was get some feedback on a couple key points from the participants. We wanted to understand if there was information out there that we were not aware of yet that would help in terms of the levy investment strategy, so data, information, reports, and whatnot. Um, and then we wanted to talk a bit about the stakeholder engagement, walking through that, the different phases of when we would be asking for stakeholders to engage, um, whether it's on the information we're using, on the technical approach, and so on. So it was a, a well-attended meeting. I think we had 37 participants outside of the project team. Um, it was very interesting. We definitely got some good feedback. Um, we definitely, there was some confusion around you know, what are you doing, what does this mean, you know, so we, I think we're able to provide some feedback and information, clarifying a lot of those questions. Um, definitely some um, frustration, I think, a little bit on both sides about, uh, you know, how is this different from what's going on, you know, another state initiative type thing. So it was it was some very good discussion. We as the project team walked away with some very good information and, and some lessons learned about as we move forward. So we'll be gearing up for the Brentwood meeting on January 6th. Um, the technical portion of our project team has been very hard at work in terms of information gathering. They've got a lot of the information together. They've been reviewing it and, and beginning to package it in a way that we as um, the council staff can begin to look through it to get a, a deep understanding of the information that's available um, and what that looks like and what where the gaps may be. And that, that will help us in the discussions as we come back to the council and also as we move through the project to understand better the information we have available. Um, I think, is there anything else, Dustin, we should highlight? Why we're up here? No, the public outreach, I think, is really probably the extensive portion of it, and just making sure everyone's aware that we did uh, reschedule the Brent one for January 6th. And we are trying to line up a lot more um, engagement with the stakeholders from agencies that we haven't uh, necessarily contacted yet. Uh, for example, some of the uh, in Delta Water agencies, or we're going to try to get together with them very soon. So that's what we're working through right now to get on their schedule and get the throughout January, get folks lined up. Um, so during this holiday season, we don't lose those two week periods. So when we come back in January, we'll have folks kind of lined up to start the next round of meeting with the local government officials and different agencies. And counties as well, I would mention. That's going to be another yes. big focus of ours in January is to meet with different elements of county staff and some of the local water, or I'm sorry, flood uh, management agencies. So. Great. And I, I think it's fair to point out that uh, Central South and North Delta agencies have been reached out to. There were yes. initial outreach meetings with representatives from yes. all those. So yes. what you're talking about is probably at the staff level and, yes. and going into greater detail. Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, that That was one of the things I was going to say. It's more, more outreach to the, to the in-Delta people is better than waiting for them to come up here and yell at you and <laughs> when you finished your report. The second thing is, um, I'm sure you're going to do an orientation for Mary Pifo from Contra Costa, mm -hmm. but you might want to make sure that this is given enough time and energy because she's very interested in that whole subvention thing that's gone on over the years and uh, it's uh, less than what she would consider 
robust use of funds at the state level. So. Okay. I, I think that concludes file item number seven. And uh, Harry, you kind of delved into going from discussion of a white paper to now discussion of another topic that's related, and I didn't comment on that because I, I didn't realize you guys were going to do that. Um, is it possible to weigh in on what we've seen at the public meetings? You know, Melinda, I will accommodate that request and I will utilize the, the form that you've already filled out Thank you. to address that. So uh, Melinda Terry, you, Ca California You wish Central to Valley. address next steps. Yeah, the next steps mm -hmm. portion. Because um, it is different. As I said, I, I do look at the white paper as kind of a scoping document. And as I said, I think there were things missed and you could broaden out the scope, if you will, to, to help your um, effort as it goes along. Um, but from... The, there unfortunately is an extreme disconnect <laughs> between the presentations uh, that we saw of what's being worked on versus what was in the white paper and scoping. And um, I, uh, it wasn't just myself, I might, some of my members, but then at the Clarksburg public meeting, just the general public were really thrown off as well. Um, the model, so we were presented a model and um, I, I relate it to kind of like, it, it will be a good tool at the back end of this process, um, particularly once the Delta Protection Commission, you know, does a feasibility study for doing some kind of assessment district, but certainly for the end of your process too, of um, allocating the costs, because really the modeling tool is kind of like, um, I relate it to kind of like a Christmas tree and ornaments, that it allows you to say, okay, if this is our baseline that we want to have in the Delta, but we've got these other things, the environmental you know, objectives that we have, we might have some, um, you know, we have some conveyance levies that we want to get you know, to this higher geotechnical standard so that they can, are more resistant to earthquakes. Those to me are like the Christmas ornaments that you might hang on, and those have different beneficiaries than the Delta residents. And so the tool will allow you to potentially identify that. But in terms of, um, really getting at identifying the things that I was mentioning of what is your actual objective? What standard do you want to have in the levies and on which levies and why do you want to have that standard? Um, and why you're choosing one of those standards in that area over the other, um, the tool isn't about identifying those standards. So we have requested a step in between moving forward with this model of um, having some workshops to pull um, folks together, not too large of a group, not a whole pub public meeting, but some folks that can help really identify, because it's kind of like the spaghetti on the wall thing. You throw the things out there, then you have to do that comparison that I said of the, the benefits and the consequences and where they complement each other and where they conflict with each other. Because that's, I think, what's going to, the state ultimately has to make some choices too, is where their Central Valley Flood Protection Plan goals and where the Delta Plan goals, which are very different than the Army Corps standards, but that's not to say we can't get around them. We just have to make a very conscious choice. And so we've asked for that interim step. Thanks. Any other public commenters? All right. Then that uh, concludes file item number seven. Cindy, Dustin, thank you. Great work. Keep up the good work. Um, I'm going to propose that we take a 10-minute break now, and uh, we'll reconvene at 11 o'clock. And uh, we'll begin with a, a few brief comments from Kavan Samson. Good morning. I know that uh, we're pressed for time today. I just wanted to give a few brief comments on the water plan and its history uh, before we let Kemi Argovecchi take over and provide his briefing on the latest iteration, which is called the Update 2013. Um, the first water plan was in 1957, and it's been produced off and on every five years since then. It's uh, DWR, it's, pro it's produced by DWR, and DWR is required to use an advisory committee comprised of urban and ag water suppliers, local government, 
business, agricultural interest, Indian, California's Indian tribes, environmentalists. So a lot of, a lot of cooks in that kitchen. Um, this, this plan is instrumental. It, it helps elected officials and water managers throughout California make informed decisions. Not only does it include data, a lot of data showing, showing status and trends, but it also provides strategies for moving forward on many of the same interests that the Delta Plan has. And in that regard, it, it's, it should be no surprise that as we were developing our Delta Plan, the California Water Plan was very much, very instrumental in some of those chapters. And likewise, after the completion of our Delta Plan, when the council had an opportunity to develop some policy, we tried to also work with the California Water Plan to implement the council's goals and visions. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Vecchi, who has been, I think, the captain of this ship for almost 20 years? No, 14. 14 years. Come here, welcome. There's a button at the base of the... Okay, there you go. thank you. So good morning. My name is Kamyar Gavechi. I'm with the California Department of Water Resources, and I currently manage statewide integrated water management. I've been with DWR since 1978, and my first job was working at the town of Hood on what was then the fish green testing facilities for the intakes of the peripheral canal. Little did I know back then what this all meant, but now I can kind of piece that all together. <laughs> And I did uh, also have the opportunity to work on the Delta Vision Task Force uh, representing DWR. So I kind of feel at home here, and I appreciate the opportunity to brief you on the high points of the uh, highlights of the California Water Plan Update 2013. Um, before that, I would like to uh, extend my appreciation to Kayvon, Sam Sam, and um, Keith Coolidge, who actually have been very active on the state agency steering committee of the water plan uh, over the last number of years and um, very, representing your council. Um, one of the, the handout I have for you today is the, the uh, highlights or the executive summary of update 2013. Um, and Little, as a little context, you, you know over the last year and a half, two years, state government has been very active in water, in large part because of the drought, uh, and also because uh, Governor Brown um, directed a number of agencies to put together a very comprehensive water action plan. And we were fortuitous in, in being able to cross-pollinate uh, many of these activities. So a year, or a little over a year ago, when the governor put out the draft water action plan, um, we put out the public review draft of update 2013. And in preparing both of those, we shared information with the various state agencies. Um, and then the, the way I see the final water plan is that's where a lot of the content is for implementing the water action plan. Uh, you know the water action plan well. When I brief folks, I basically say, if you want to know what state government's doing in water for the next four years, last year was for the next five years, read the water action plan. And this is, uh, while it's only 19 pages, because it is a multi-agency administration initiative, it is organizing the work of our agencies as well as our budget requests and our resource allocation. So, the work of state government is being um, organized around the water action plan. And the reason that that works is because, as you know, the 10 actions of the action plan are very comprehensive. Since my tenure at DWR uh, from 1978 to now, every administration has had a water initiative. This is, by and large, the most comprehensive uh, water initiative to date, and I think it's going, it is and will serve the state and state government uh, well. So I and the water plan turned 57 this year. Maybe I was destined to work on it. Um, we have updated it uh, 10 times now, as uh, called Bulletin 160. And this update of the water plan, as I mentioned, did, uh, does have a strong nexus with the governor's water action plan. Um, one of the things I do like to note for folks is while the water code says that DWR updates the plan, 
It also goes on to say there's no mandates in the plan and no funding is automatically authorized. And the way I think of it is this is the legislators, legislature's way of saying the executive branch develops the plan, but you can't unilaterally implement it. You, you have to uh, work with the legislature on the resourcing and the funding and the priorities of the plan. So the water plan is a large document, well over 3,500 pages, and we've organized it in different volumes based on their intended readership. Uh, volume one is the strategic plan. We call it the Roadmap for Action. Uh, it includes the elements of the strategic plan. I'll go over that a little bit more in a minute. We also have a volume on 30 resource management strategies, 12 regional reports, one of which focuses on the Delta and was developed in close coordination with the uh, Stewardship Council staff and the Delta Conservancy staff. We also have water portfolios and balances, uh, future scenarios, and a lot of supporting reference and technical information. At your meeting last uh, month, you did uh, put out uh, what we're calling the water plan placemat. And uh, if you go to page two and three of the highlights, it's the same information with a fold out uh, on the back. And on one part of the placemat are the five key messages of this plan. And what I'm saying is if you take away nothing more than these five messages, that's important. And the fact that water is essential for California, that our water system is in crisis uh, and very complex to understand and manage, that we have to use a diverse portfolio approach in, in overcoming these challenges, and that we have to focus on integration, alignment, and investment. I'll talk more about that in coming up with these solutions. And that everyone in California has a role to play. The placemat also um, uh, talks about the nexus with the governor's water action plan. And on the back, it has the 10 actions of the action plan. This is a fold out in your highlights on page three. Uh, in green, and then under each one has the content in the water plan that can be used to help implement those 10 actions. So it's like a smart index to the water plan through the lens of the governor's water action plan. So uh, when we talk about integrated water management in the water plan, we think of it as achieving three major outcomes improving public safety, which includes uh, safe drinking water as well as uh, flood protection, uh, fostering environmental stewardship, uh, and supporting a stable economy. And there are many activities and actions that uh, go under each one of those uh, three. As we worked on this update of the water plan, three themes bubbled up. We have to double down on integrated water management. It's something that the state has committed to since the early 2000s. It is working, but there's a lot more work that needs to be done. The other thing we're hearing from folks who are trying to implement multi-benefit integrated water management projects, it's very time consuming, it's very costly, and in large part because government is not structured to support it. So the plans, the policies, and the regulations that we have developed, state, federal, and local governments, were not developed with integrated water management in mind. It was a much more siloed approach. And so when you're trying to get folks to do multi-benefit projects, these policies and regulations sometimes collide or pull people in different directions. So a big part of this water plan is offering recommendations for how government, particularly state government, can create the in administrative infrastructure to advance um, integrated water management. And then the third is to uh, invest in innovation and infrastructure, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. So the call to integrate is a recognition or a realization that our water cycle uh, and our water resources are very interconnected, yet the way we govern water is very decentralized and fragmented. So we have to that, that's one of the aspects of integration. And since 2002, 2003, the state of California has now, with Prop 1 passing, committed um, uh, almost $2.5 billion to advancing integrated regional water management. Today we have 48 regional water management groups. 
They cover 87% of the territory of California and almost, uh, or just over 99% of the population. And these 48 groups are at different levels of development. Some are very cutting edge. Others are just beginning to talk with each other for the first time. And really, the, the, one of the activities that brings them together is to develop an integrated regional water management plan. That makes them eligible to compete for the IRWM grant funds. And then the last bullet on the slide is really what we're trying to achieve and to increase regional self-reliance through the uh, implementation of these integrated plans. So for, as you're trying to prepare for your future needs and demands, don't look long distances for your water supplies as we've done in the past. So how well is this IRWM working? This slide shows the 10 hydrologic regions. There's a bar, a stack bar in each hydrologic region. The light part on the top is the amount of state funding that has been committed to date. That's uh, through the better part of Prop 84, but not all. The darker part underneath is how much the locals have brought to the table. And for every dollar that the state has committed or spent, the locals have brought four to five dollars of their own to advance this approach. So this is really good evidence that it's working and the pie chart shows those multi-benefits that are uh, being accrued or will be realized from the implementation of those projects. So this is a really biggie. We have to, as part of integrated water management, manage our flood system, our water supply system, or water quality management together. We have to reduce flood risks in ways that helps recharge our groundwater basins and improves our floodplain ecosystems. In the past, because we worked in silos, even within the Department of Water Resources, one group solution could actually cause a problem for another group. And, and this integrated approach will prevent that from happening. Now this is the biggie for California. Cities and counties uh, plan for land use. Water agencies do the water management. Historically, they haven't communicated well or planned well together. There are num now a number of those 48 regional water management groups that include cities, counties, and water agencies, plus other interests um, on the group. So I think we have to continue to push the envelope to get better planning and coordination between land use and water management because good, um, smart land use planning, there's clear evidence that leads to more efficient um, and sustainable water management. So the call to align, agency alignment. Um, we, as part of this water plan, uh, working with stakeholders and other agencies, have come up with principles and a number of actions to align our work um, a big part is to really um, come up with policies that are regionally appropriate from a state perspective. So aligning our plans, policies, and regulations doesn't mean you come up with a cookie cutter approach that works the same everywhere, but it does mean that we have to make sure that state government has the same, same end game in mind, and then we give regions the flexibility to come up with the implementation plan that they would need to achieve those outcomes. And the last part of the slide is just showing that the water plan has tried to practice what it preach, preaches so that we now do have a 28 state agency steering committee uh, that's uh, been instrumental in guiding update 09 and 2013 of the water plan. And by virtue of having the agencies on the steering committee, we have brought together their what we call state companion plans related to water. When we came up with our first inventory of lists for 2013, over 180 plans of some sort of, that these 28 agencies have related to water. We culled that down to 60 nexus plans that had some direct relevance to the water plan. And then of those, we identified 37 featured plans. And by featured, we meant we actually pulled recommendations from them to inform the water plan. The Delta plan is one of those 37 featured plans. 
And so it, it is an important component um, of this update of the water plan. This, um, important to invest, this um, graph shows the investment in integrated water management as well as we could compile since 1995 to 2010. The green line really shows that most investment occurs locally in California. And as of 2010, that was in about $18 billion per year. The red line shows state has been investing about two, a little over $2 billion a year, and the Fed's just under $1 billion. So we're looking at $20, $21 billion a year as of 2010. And what we say in the water plan is if we just continue that level of investment over the next decade, $200 billion would just hold our own. We would not resolve many of the crises that we're now confronted with. So the water plan says we really need to think more in terms of $500 billion investment over the next decade, decade, decade and a half. And so where is that money going to come from is going to be a big part of the conversation. So innovation and infrastructure. By innovation, we mean finding ways to improve governance of water, finding ways to improve planning and public engagement, finding ways to improve agency alignment, as, I, as I've discussed, information technology. How can we do a better job of collecting data, managing data, exchanging data, and using those data in analytical tools? And I know that the council and your science program is looking at this uh, topic closely, and we look forward to uh, continued collaboration on this data management topic. Water technology and science. How can, we, how can the state invest in ways to commercialize and, and make more um, uh, effective new technologies, doing the same thing more cost effectively? Infrastructure. By infrastructure, we mean both green infrastructure, improving watersheds, ecosystems, and floodplains, as well as human gray infrastructure at multiple scales, and the state has a, a, a responsibility and a role to invest in all of those innovation activities and to cost share in the infrastructure activities. Now here's where the push comes to show. The innovation activities are in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The infrastructure are hundreds of billions of dollars. Yet when push comes to shove, the funding for the innovation activities are the first to go. And what we're trying to really advance in this water plan is if the state, even unilaterally, were to invest in those innovation activities, it'll provide a windfall to make better uh, infrastructure decisions at the local and regional level. So given that finance is a big part, we added a chapter to this update of the water plan. Volume 1, Chapter 7, is the water finance planning chapter. Susan Tatalian was a co-chair of, of that caucus, along uh, with um, the Aqua, David Bolin from Aqua. Uh, it was one of the most well-attended caucuses. Probably 30 to 40 people attended each one of those meetings. And when we embarked on doing this in 2013, we had this idea that we would end up with a finance plan for the water plan. Well, we couldn't get there. And the reason we couldn't get there, one of the big reasons, is people can't even talk about finance using the same terms in the same way and thinking about the finance planning process uh, similarly. And so we were getting people talking past each other. And so what we did is we've come up with an eight-step finance planning framework that the stakeholders have bought into or support. And we've advanced that in this update of the water plan. We've also come up with shared values, principles, that the stakeholders feel would help guide those decisions that have to be made. And because we didn't end up with a finance planning set of uh, strategies, we ended up with attributes. So we know that the conversation has to continue, and we're saying those who continue the conversation should pay close attention to these particular attributes of finance planning. The other thing you'll find in this chapter is a detailed table matrix of all the different financing instruments that have been used or considered in the state of California and a, a, an initial analysis of their strengths and limitations. 
Um, and um, depending on people's inclination, they will go to different instruments and, and say, we should do this, that, or the other thing. Okay. So if you go to the center of the middle of your highlights, there's a double fold out. And what we tried to do is summarize on four pages the entire strategic plan. So the vision, the mission, the goals, the guiding principles, and the 17 key objectives. Now, one thing I'd like to point out is guiding principles on page 10B, the first one is an expansion of the co-equal goals guidance of the Delta plan. What we've done in the water plan is says, this doesn't just apply to the Delta. This should be an ethic and an approach that applies to all water planning and management in California. So this is now one of the guiding principles uh, of the water plan. And again, I don't have time to go through all 17 of these objectives, but uh, um, they are very closely um, uh, aligned with the governor's water action um, plan. And items 14, 15, 16, and 17 objectives, those are, focus those are new for this update of the water plan. They focus on providing access public access to water, strengthening the alignment of land use and water, strengthening agency alignment, and improving our water financing. So just, I'm just going to quickly hit on some of the objectives that I think would be of particular interest to, the, to, to you. Uh, objective seven is about the delta. And what I want to assure you is this, we did not end run the Delta plan or the council, this is uh, a summary or a, a concise description of the Delta plan recommendations in the California water plan. What's unique about the water plan, again, we're trying to knit all of these companion plans together in an, I, in an integrated water management framework and show that they can work, uh, work together. Uh, another one is, uh, strengthening integrated regional water management. I know that the Delta plan uh, does uh, have recommendations along this line. Another is using and reusing water more efficiently. Water conservation is a big part of the water plan and the water action plan. Uh, one of the things we do offer and um, is we have a recommendation in there. And when I say we, it's the big we. To, to suggest that we should look to a 2030 water conservation goal as we move forward. We right now are operating under the 20 by 2020, 20% reduction in per capita water use by 2020. What we are suggesting here is if you take the total water use, if we achieve, when, if and when we achieve that 20%, we, and you look at the total water use reduction relative to the year 2000, we're saying that let's, for between 2020 and 2030, keep total water, urban water use constant. And by doing that, we would basically be going to a 30% reduction of per capita water use relative to the year 2000. So it's kind of keeping the same trajectory, but pushing on uh, to 2030. A big part of the water plan is, is uh, promoting conjunctive water management groundwater with multiple uh, other supply sources, not just stored surface water, but surface uh, uh, runoff, recycle water, storm water capture, and noting that the conjunctive water management can be an effective management tool. You are well aware of the Sustainable Groundwater Act. I just put this in here because it's, it's, a, con it's a consistent, uh, it's, totally consistent with the recommendations that are in the California Water Plan under conjunctive groundwater management. And it's a four-phase process. Uh, the first phase is for authorities to be identified. The second phase is to have them develop groundwater management plans. The third phase, which I think is really where the meat is, is to develop water budgets. And the development of water budgets for each basin, all the water uses and all the multiple supplies is really what's going to guide folks on where they're limited and what they're going to need to do to become more sustainable. And then the fourth phase is to uh, just track and make sure they're achieving their groundwater plans. And as you well know, the, the Act also 
gives the State Water Resource Control Board the authority to step in anywhere along the way if a basin authority does not follow through on one of those phases. Uh, protecting uh, ground, uh, water quality, both surface and groundwater, you have an entire chapter uh, on that in the Delta Plan, and the recommendations here are consistent with that. Practicing environmental stewardship. Uh, we worked with uh, Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, and others on um, coming up with these related actions. One of the companion plans is the Fish and Wildlife Action Plan, the State Action uh, Fish. Uh, and wildlife Action Plan. Fish and Wildlife is now updating that plan and, and that will become the, the new companion plan when it's done. Uh, flood management. We, uh, the, you're aware of the Flood Future Report and the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. They're both companion plans to the water plan and we uh, drew recommendations from them. So uh, we're, I'm very close to the end. I just wanted to flash on this slide the 30 plus resource management strategies. This is the toolbox of integrated water management. They're organized on this slide by what they're intended to do. We have a chapter on each of the strategies. There are implementation challenges identified in those chapters and recommendations for how we could be more effective um, at implementing these strategies. The idea, and, and we added three new strategies for update 2013, sediment management, outreach and engagement, and water and culture. And this is my concluding slide. The idea here is we need to get the word out. We need to use the content of the water plan to help implement the gov governor's water action plan. And if you already don't subscribe to the water plan e-news, one page every Wednesday afternoon, I uh, strongly encourage you to subscribe. It's not just about water plan events, we also include uh, announcements for the Delta Stewardship Council meetings uh, and other important water planning information. And with that, I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Come here. Thank you. Questions? Comments? Phil? I, I have listened to Kamiar for how many years now? We've been... Yeah, Delta uh, Vision. He is one of the great unheralded voices in the water battles uh, of California. And he has an unvarying good nature. But I don't know if you have not heard him present before how much you can appreciate an energized Kamiar. And the conversation today is uh, kind of notable because when, when we didn't went through Dell Division, you were not always as uh, upbeat as you are today. And uh, trying to look at it, uh, I think the, uh, the wisdom of emphasizing the governor's water action plan is also a practical reality that, that folks like Kamiar serve four or five governors in their career. And governors always have different ideas. And for an administration in any area, they need continuity of themes in order to get things done. And the great achievement uh, I think DWR has had in the last 30 years has been to glom on to, promote, and kind of get generally accepted the notion of integrated water management and regional self-sufficiency. Now, that doesn't stop everybody from saying me and mine first but, and give me more money, but it sure civilize, helps to civilize a, a, a very difficult and painful discussion. So uh, in spite of my complaints about your endless butterfly chart trying to show where all the water comes from that I've never been able to understand, uh, I just want to say thank you for doing it. It's a terrific report. I don't know, how did they talk you into sticking with this subject area all these years? Well, it's my passion. Yeah. Um, so I, I'm actually signing up for 2018. We're going to start working on that early next calendar year. There you are. There you are. Thank you. Thank you. Dan? Yeah, Camiar, the, the planner in me is always envious of the work you guys do, you know, and it's got such great graphics. But one of the things that I think is a challenge for us, and we're talking about it next, and so maybe your own experience can give them some guidance, is the um, identifying kind of performance measures. What are the objectives that can provide the benchmarks to see where we're going? and. Mm -hmm and we're making the success that we hope to. You talked about two. Uh, one was upgrading efficiency, though, so that we can save 30% by 2030, hold our current urban water use uh, flat. And then I noticed on slide 28, 
You've got two uh, uh, kind of objectives for habitat restoration, uh, enhancing a million acres of watersheds and forests and meadows, and then the million acres of riparian wetlands and floodplains, um, which both seem pretty ambitious at the pace at which the Forest Service is able to work and certainly the pace at which habitat restoration occurs. How did you set a number like that? And is it aspirational or is it actually a target you think you can achieve by when? How do you do that? Well, the timeline or, or uh, planning horizon for this is 2050 for this update of the water plan. So we weren't planning to do this in the next few years. However, uh, so in that sense, one could think of it as aspirational, but I think it's practical. And in some respects, I think it suggests that if we don't do this level of restoration, we're not going to achieve the co-equal goals that we're um, advancing. And there are many ecosystem services that we can benefit from as we um, restore our meadows. For instance, um, the meadows, upper meadows, can help attenuate floods. It can help recharge upper groundwater basins. Uh, it can improve the water quality and sediment that's uh, experienced downstream. Uh, I, I think, again, because we've worked in our silos, we didn't bring together the resources to work on this across jurisdictions. And I, IRWM is now a real good example where the Forest Service has worked with l the counties and the local entities to do meadow restoration. Uh, right now, the Forest Service is working with the Santa Ana Water Authority, Watershed Authority, to do upper uh, headwater restoration. So I think, to me, one of the benefits of integrated water management is getting people to bring their, their issues and their assets together and mixing and match them in ways that people could never realize before. And, and so these, these are targets, not uh, specific metrics. I will note that in the water plan uh, cycle 2013, we did a progress report, a mid-course progress report to say, how did we do in update 09? And what we quickly realized is we, d we haven't expressed our recommendations in ways smart enough to be able to track their implementation. So for 2013, we really tried to do a better job, the big we, in coming up with recommendations that says who will do what, by when. Um, and in um, a table, we actually have offered some performance metrics that could be tracked. Peter? Yeah, just a couple of quick comments, Camille, and uh, <coughs> you've obviously seen the scope of this plan, but one of the things that's really amazed me is the attention that this plan has got around the U.S. and particularly internationally. You know, the World Bank's, you've been taking a very close look at it and uh, s some of the U.N. elements. So I think just the scope of this, how it's been presented, you know, it's so clear to read and understand. It's uh, really a terrific job. And the other comment I would just like to reiterate, just we really appreciate your um, commitment to innovation because these problems are so big and they're so new that there needs to be this you, you applied research that could really do things so much more efficiently. So yeah, I know we've been talking about a lot of these things, but to have that voice and when you give these examples of where innovation has really made a very big impact to do things more cheaply, more comprehensively, you're more available. You know, I think it's really just moving us towards this new paradigm. So those Thank you. two comments, it's great. Thank you. One, one of my favorite jobs is dot connecting. And given the work that I do, I, I get to learn about multiple initiatives. And uh, to the extent that I can, I, I, try, I suggest where those um, uh, cross-pollination can occur. And one of the examples for this update is we added an objective on water technology. And in working on it, we, we learned that there's actually a group, an entity that's created by the legislature, the California Council for Science and Technology, CCST, and their mandate and mission is to identify uh, good technology investments for the state of California and to make recommendations to the legislature and the governor. 
And it just was fortuitous because they had picked water as one of their research topics during this cycle update of the water plan. And so we work together. They have now got a water technology roadmap document out, and those recommendations are echoed in the water plan. So it's those kinds of uh, cross-pollination that I think can, can make it work. Others? Kamyar, I'm a big fan of yours, of the work that you um, manage in the diverse group of folks that you bring together to produce these plans. Um, I'm, I'm surprised Phil didn't ask for this because he's, he's usually one to ask for something in writing beyond what you present. I, I think you um, possess a great deal of knowledge about how to bring uh, people together to collaborate and to cooperate that lead to agreements. And, and that's a unique skill set in, in this environment. I would encourage you someday in your spare time to write a white paper uh, just advocating some of the, the key elements that, uh, that, that, in, that are fundamental to your approach to this type of process. I think it would be um, very helpful to people like ourselves whose responsibility it is to bring uh, people together to cooperate and collaborate to lead to action. So thank you for coming. I appreciate the great work that you have done, that you are doing, that you will do. And uh, it's great to have you with us. Well, today. thank you. And I don't know if it would qualify as the white paper you have in mind, uh, Randy, but for each cycle of the water plan, 05, 09, and now 2013, we have put together what we call a process guide and I'd be happy to share it with the council and staff where we describe the process we use for that particular update, uh, both on the collaborative side and the planning side. And maybe after having looked at that, is if you have ideas for what more you'd like to see, I'd be happy to work with you on that. All right, we welcome that. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Kivon, any final comments? Well, I think instead of writing a white paper, he should write a book and sell it. <laughs> That's another good suggestion. All right, thank you. Um, any uh, public comment regarding file item eight? None. On to then file item number nine, report on progress in implementing the Delta plan and performance measures. Cindy Messer, John Ryan, welcome. Okay, so get all our paperwork organized here, but thank you. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and run us through the presentation this morning, but I wanna start off by acknowledging John Ryan and his team who have been working nonstop over this last year on Delta Plan performance measures. And today's presentation is really to provide the council with an update on where we're at with our work related to performance measures. We were last here in July to provide an update and then talk a little bit about the progress to date and also some next steps where we'll go from here. So, um, as you recall, we, when we came to you in July, we had a, a fairly beefy staff report, PowerPoint presentation, in which we talked about the 161 Delta Plan performance measures, split into three categories, administrative measures, output measures, and out, outcome measures. Make sure I get that right. Um, and what staff had been doing over the year, early in the year, we had done a lot of planning for how, how do we organize, how do we begin to assess these performance measures and move ourselves into implementation and reporting of progress related to those performance measures. And then we launched into the assessment phase. And that's what staff have been working on over this last year. Uh, we have, uh, and what we've reflected in the staff report is we've split it between the administrative measures and the output outcome measures to kind of summarize that. But we've made it through all of the 
administrative performance measures. There's 118 of those. And by assessment, maybe I should take a step back, um, really what we've been doing is looking at each and every one of the performance measures to clearly identify what are the metrics that we're, we'll be measuring. What are the targets? What's the baseline? And then the step beyond that is what is the information that we need to bring together, um, compile, look at, so that we can measure success using the, the performance measures. And with the administrative measures, it's a, it's a much more straightforward process as you can imagine. Those are measures that really are around target or dates and reports. Um, they have very fixed milestones that, which you can measure completion. Uh, the output outcome measures are a lot more complicated. These are measures that give us a sense of the results from actions we've taken, whether it's habitat restoration for species improvements, uh, flood management and activities related to that, water uh, supply reliability, um, uh, and different measures related to that. So a lot more data is required. Uh, the baseline, the targets, the, measure, the metrics themselves are far more complicated. Uh, same with the outcome uh, measures, which give us a sense of the trends. So for the work, the projects we've implemented, the data we're looking at, what are we moving in the right direction? What does progress look like? So um, the staff have, if you recall, with the output outcome measures, we selected a set of 10 out of the 33 outcome out, output measure output outcome measures to really uh, begin to deconstruct, if you will, to take them down to the fundamental elements, the, their metrics. Clearly um, identifying, if it wasn't already um, quite obvious, what the baseline was, what the targets are, and then looking at the information we need to gather, and then taking that next step of who do we need to be talking to from the other agencies that are doing the monitoring, are collecting this information. So a lot of process, as you can imagine, but um, all of this work leads towards a very solid foundation for the Delta Plan performance measures. And uh, moving forward will allow us to make some recommendations back to the council in terms of where we need some decisions, where we may need to make some refinements around these performance measures. So um, going just quickly through the report, I just wanted to touch upon the summaries we have in here in terms of first the administrative performance measures. So what we've done um, is, is summarize a lot of information. As you can imagine behind just the, the page and a half you have in here around administrative measures, there's a lot of spreadsheets, a lot of information that John and his team as well as the planning staff have been engaged in collecting over this last year. So talking to a lot of different agency staff, program staff, um, just looking online, collecting this information. And what we found over this last year, when we look at our own 118 administrative measures, is that um, 16 of them, or 14%, have actually been completed, and we've outlined that in the staff report. 78 of the measures, or about 66%, are what we're calling active. And I should caveat that um, by saying that, in this case, the category of active covers a very wide range of progress. So it includes those measures that have just gotten off the ground and progress is beginning to those that are almost completed. So it, it is a wide range. And then 24 of the 118 measures, or 20% of them, are what we're we're labeling as inactive. And so these are measures that haven't had any, haven't launched yet, haven't had any activities um, undertaken on them yet. And so moving back, I wanted to um, acknowledge a few things about the administrative measures that have been completed. So there, there are six agencies that we listed in, in the staff report that we wanted to give some credit to around these administrative measures. So ourselves being one, um, and we've listed some examples in there, but also Department of Water Resources, the State Board, Regional Boards, uh, Delta Protection Commission, and the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So um, kudos to them um, for getting some of our administrative measures completed over the year. And then um, something that I wanted to acknowledge about the active administrative measures is that, again, it, it runs the whole gauntlet of Delta Plan chapters, area, subject areas, 
Um, some of the highlights that we've included in the staff report um, in terms of, uh, I think, those that are kind of high profile that a lot of uh, folks know about that work is being undertaken on, we've included in the staff report. But for example, um, the state water project, water contract extensions, a process we've been tracking um, and also participating in meetings. Uh, Bay Delta Conservation Plan is moving ahead um, in its draft documents and uh, public release of those. Water storage studies is another very good example of one of the administrative measures that we have in the Delta Plan that has seen a lot of activity over this last year and with the water bond will continue to be um, up front and center and others that I probably um, don't need to go through at this point. The last point I want to make about administrative performance measures are those that we've labeled as inactive. And just very quickly, some of the reasons why we have found, anyway, when we've been talking to the different agencies and kind of bringing the information together, um, really there were three primary reasons that we found that administrative measures have not launched yet. One is timing. Um, in some cases, the deadlines for some of these are far enough out in the future that the initiative just it isn't ripe to begin at this point, but it will. Um, for example, Delta Plan update. We've got a future date that over this last year, we have not really, you know, plan or haven't had discrete activities around that just yet, but that's obviously forthcoming. Um, resource limitations is another one and with some of the agencies we talked to, and this kind of falls into two categories. One is just simply a lack of either staff or funding to move forward with some of the performance measures. And in some cases, it's affected by elements such as the drought. So that, in, for some of the agencies, has shifted a lot of uh, staffing resources, funding resources to deal with that priority not leaving necessarily resources to work on some of the other existing programs or activities. And then in some cases, we realize with some of the performance measures, it's a dependency on other activities taking place. And really, I would say a lot of these are where we call for legislative action. So there's maybe a project that that's tied to, for example, maybe the Delta Levy Investment Strategy. Working on the strategy now, will um, have an outcome and results of that that will lead to these future actions that are specified. Um, so again, just n the timing is, is a factor there. So uh, maybe I'll switch to out, uh, output and outcome performance measures very quickly. As, as I mentioned, um, staff had selected 10 of the 33 for a pie. I'm sorry, 43. Yeah, um, there's 33 left, right? <laughs> Uh, to, to do as a pilot study, and that's what they've been working on. Um, and in figure four of your staff report, we listed the short titles of those, just uh, so everyone can recall what those are. There's two measures from each of the policy chapters, so chapters three through seven of the Delta Plan. And we've included two of the performance measures in the staff report itself, just to kind of highlight some progress and to, so that you could see sort of the, the categories, the metrics, um, the factors that staff have been gathering information around um, that as they were putting together their specification sheets and talking to other agencies. And just a couple things about these generalizing, these, these 10 measures. Um, the work the staff have done, I've, I've mentioned that, I don't think I'll go through that again, but some of the lessons learned so far in the last six or months or eight months or so that we've been working through these in great detail is that um, indeed there's information available for many of these. In some cases there isn't really data available just yet um, or it's it, we're poised and ready to be able to get information. And a good example is one of the performance measures we've highlighted in here, the, the aquatic habitat restoration. Lots of good projects, a handful of projects poised and ready to go over this next year. So right now our baseline um, for data, available data is zero, though I will put, Dan mentioned the Calhoun Cut project. So we've got a 160 acre project that they've uh, broken ground on. So that'll be our first data set to go in there. But we know data is forthcoming. It's not there yet. There's a lot of dependency on some of the other agencies that we'll need to be coordinating very closely with, working with to make sure as they're uh, undertaking projects, as they're hitting key milestones, we're able to get that information so that we can in turn report on progress. Um, 
I would say some of the other lessons learned uh, have to do with the metrics themselves. In some cases, they're identified already or we've been able to develop baseline targets. But in some cases, what we're finding is we need to reach out a little bit further to some subject matter experts, probably in some other agencies um, uh, and even amongst our staff here, to really sit down and determine what, uh, what are the targets, what are the metrics, what makes sense to measure. It's some of the performance measures um, are broad in nature, and so what we're doing is taking that down to a focused uh, level, but we don't necessarily have in-house um, expertise at this point to make those calls. So again, a, a lot of coordination. John and his team have been doing a lot of setting the stage for letting other agency staff know about Delta Plan performance measures, know about the process we're undertaking, and just creating that network and those relationships so we can pick up the phone, get these groups together, and talk through some of the details. Um, as I mentioned earlier, with some of the inactive uh, administrative measures, one of the lessons, one of the things we're hearing is having to do a bit with funding deficiencies, um, and that links back to a data that may not be available. It may not be available in the near term until funding is identified for additional research or monitoring. Um, same with staffing gaps as well. And um, it, one of the, the things that we are doing with the output and outcome measures is to catalog refinements that staff will come back to, staff suggestions or suggested refinements that we'll come back to the council with on some of these, these output and outcome measures. As we're going through and we're really taking the deep dive into what does it mean to measure these, um, we're identifying where we might need to make some changes that we'd like to bring back to the council for discussion um, at a future date. And um, with that, I can go into next steps, but I, I think Dan wants to add something. I think to me, you know, as a planner, this is an interesting and kind of innovative element of the Delta Plan. California has required planning in lots of areas for a long time. If you work in a local government on a land use plan, I'm not aware of any requirement in the government code that says you have to have a performance measure, except as it relates to housing. Um, in the uh, coastal plan, Coastal plan, there's no requirement for how, what the setting up performance measure for how much access should be available. It's just a go provide access. Um, and this, you know, the planning we did for state park plans didn't say, oh, make sure you're accommodating 25% of the camping need or hiking need in California. They just said, take care of the land and make sure people can enjoy it, you know. Where here's a very unique requirement in the Reform Act that we're supposed to identify performance measures that we can use to track the progress of the plan and use it as a basis for adaptive management. And you uh, did a good job in adopting the plan, providing an initial set of those. And we promised we would work with those and refine them as we move ahead, but there really is, we're finding, I think, through this review, pretty useful in making sure we can see are we doing what we said we could do? Yeah, with a few exceptions, but yeah, people are moving ahead, a lot of engagement. Are we getting the, out the changes that we wanted to see on the landscape or in our water facilities? We're starting to see that. And then the big question is, hey, are we getting the results we want? And, you know, we've only been at this a few years, so big system like this, you're not going to see change in a day. But I think you've got a great basis here, and the Cindy's team has done good work, and I think people will be watching this and seeing, hey, how do we roll it out in the future and make it more, make the adaptive management promise that's in the Reform Act make it real. But I, I think it's a great start. Larry? <clears throat> Just to uh, kind of add to that, when I came here, uh, we were supposed to have this in place, and it wasn't here. So in the short time that I've been here, this is, this has happened. It was, you know, when you come and you, and you kind of get dropped into Delta stewardship, it's kind of like, you know, you, they throw you in the deep end and you better be able to swim or you're in deep trouble. <laughs> this type of thing will help new people as they come on kind of get their footing and figure out where you are in this continuum that's moving along. So, uh, I mean, this is going to make it much easier for my 
replacement to kind of get an idea of what's going on. As it was, you just get, they just do a, a information dump on you and, and <laughs> you just do the best you can. So, thank you, appreciate it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Cindy, mm -hmm. next. Okay, so quickly next steps, and I think that will, um, so one thing I'll just mention is we've been staffing up in John's uh, shop. He's been, um, it was John and one other person with a small consulting team doing this work, so we've been fortunate to get some new permanent positions and have been starting to fill those with some wonderful, uh, talented people, so stay tuned for more good work with additional horsepower behind this. Um, we'll continue with the administrative measures to track um, the measures, gather that information. We're keeping that, as you can imagine, in a database for, uh, format. And as we move forward, one of the things we're, we're looking at is online tools, so reporting tools, dashboards, um, just very concise summaries of what's going on. So that's another kind of behind the scenes right now effort that we've really been working right. on. We're just not quite ready to showcase anything yet. But getting close. Getting close. Okay. Getting close. Continued coordination with other agencies. And then the big focus, big push for us uh, through the rest of this fiscal year is to um, go through the remaining 33 output outcome measures, go through this same exercise of deconstructing, defining all the elements, and then at the end of that, coming back to the council with that full suite of um, summaries and recommendations and so on. It's a great plan. Good work. Any comments or questions? John, I've got a question of you, so yes, that you just didn't come up to sit. <laughs> <What'd I say? laughs> um, <laughs> this past year, uh, the drought has driven a lot of the activity in the agencies that you have to interact with. Describe uh, the level of cooperation you've achieved among your peers and the other agencies as, as you've drawn upon them to get the information you need. I would say that the, the level of collaboration has been excellent for us. I've, um, I've been through a lot of stops and starts with performance measures over the years. And um, I, I also wanted to go back and thank the council. My team specifically wanted to thank the council for giving us this opportunity to um, build this framework and this foundation for for future performance measures because like I did say we we just have had a lot of stops and starts and I really believe that this is going to give us the the um, opportunity to effectively you know collect the data that we need to collect analyze the data and then build something sustainable uh, for the future so I uh, definitely wanted to thank the council for that. Part of that, Randy, yes, over the last especially six months, uh, we've been heavily engaged with a lot of our uh, partner agencies, um, with the Water Monitoring Council, uh, uh, San Francisco uh, Estuary Institute, a lot of the players that are heavily involved in the collection of data. Um, we have been supporting and endorsing uh, their efforts and, and, and trying to provide as much uh, support as we can and at the same time we're getting a lot of um, excellent feedback so I think as we move forward um, and as we start to tee these performance measures up using this effective foundation uh, I think the collaboration and the assistance that we're going to get going both ways is going to be is going to be very good so I think it's been it, it has really improved over the last six months or 12 months from what it was a couple of years back and especially going back into the CalFed era okay good that's good news Cindy, any final comments? Nope, I, I would just echo John's thank you for um, working with us through this mm -hmm. process and we've got a good set of measures that we're um, assessing and we'll be implementing and again, thanks to John and his team for thank you. a lot of dedicated hours to this. We'll be so, rolling up our sleeves. Good, yeah. well I know you already have. <laughs> thank you very much. Thank you. Any thank you. public comment on this matter? All right, um, file item. All right, we do have a comment on file item number nine. It sounds like it's radioactive. <laughs> <laughs> Michael Brodsky, welcome. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. 
Um, Ms. Messer said that in some cases uh, we need to reach out and determine exactly what the metrics are going to be for the performance measures. And I wanted to ask about the performance measure for restoring delta flows. Um, the delta plan says progress toward restoring in delta flows to more natural functional flow patterns to support a healthy estuary. That's the goal. Mm -hmm. And then the metrics are results from hydrological monitoring and hydrodynamic modeling. But the typical measures for assessing flows such as flow in cubic feet per second or export inflow ratio or percent of unimpaired flow or the location of X2, none of those things have been selected yet. Is, am I correct in understanding that? Well, I think what we'll be doing is, for those, is uh, relying in large part on objectives that are set in the Bay Delta Water Quality right. Plan. So in that case, because the, the plan is going through an update as the board reconsiders some of those issues, I think we're waiting on their guidance. So the, you won't be adopting your own performance measures or making any, any judgment, any independent judgment on what would constitute uh, a restored, more natural delta flow. You'll, you'll wait for the board to do that. I think, you know, the board has got that responsibility and expertise and, I, and of course, under state, under the Reform Act, you know, their, their role in terms of those issues is recognized. I think we want to see what they do and then we'll assess whether there's anything further that's required. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, on to file item number 10. Is there any public comment on any matter? All right, I use this opportunity if there's anyone, any of my colleagues on the council that wish to make any final comments before we close the meeting. I would like to wish my colleagues a happy uh, uh, holiday and New Year's uh, and uh, a wet one. A wet one, except not too wet, right? <laughs> Good. See you next year. Thank you, and uh, thanks to all of those who follow our work here in person, online. A Merry Christmas to each and every one of you. Thank you. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>